Thank you for coming, and thank you, Asha, uh, and others for arranging this. Um, I'm sorry about the technical aspect of how you're going to interact with R in the course of these lectures. There are many different ways to do it. In fact, there's a little slide that we'll look at that reviews some of them. And I think in the not too distant future, we'll come up with a way so that you can do computations in an environment like the one that I'm running, if not identical to it. So you can try things out yourself. That's the basic idea. We instructors will give some ideas underlying some things that make Bioconductor the influential environment for doing genome scale statistics that it is. And um, the idea was that the, the four folks who will be uh, who are here to, to help out will be wandering around the room to see if people are having trouble with any part of these computations. Uh, I think it's really important that we have an interactive relationship. So uh, I do um, uh, ask that you interrupt me. If I'm not looking in your direction while you're waving your hand, just go ahead and ask me to stop. And uh, we clarify what is going on here. <clears throat> now, um, how many of you work with R on a regular basis? How many of you work with Jupyter Notebooks on a regular basis? Not that many, okay. So I was in that boat as well. I work with R just about every day, never worked with a Jupyter Notebook, and then Ashok said, well, we're going to use them. And then uh, I found that it was really a very uh, congenial environment for doing what we're going to do in the course. So it's worth learning about, and um, I, I don't think that's going to be an obstacle in any way as long as we get it running. <clears throat> now, how's the font here? Is this big enough for folks to see? It's not really so much of a lecture slide presentation, but um, <clears throat> I'll make sure that, that, that we get through the basic points. <clears throat> It'd be nice to ask people why they want to know about Bioconductor, but I, I think we have too many to really go over it. <clears throat> the, the appreciation for R can come from many different domains. One of the most basic ones is they said, there's a lot of code in it, and I need to use some of it. Uh, but to get more of an appreciation of it, what we put a lot of our time into is interoperability, so that it runs on many different platforms, uh, all the key operating systems and so on. And the software component collection is very rich, so that you can do all kinds of different statistical modeling approaches, you can use all kinds of database backends, you can work with the web, and so on and so forth. And yes, other languages uh, accomplish this, but our integrated statistical reasoning with those functionalities a bit earlier than some of the other languages, and we've kept it going uh, since 2000 or so when we started Bioconductor. <clears throat> so this is a motivation for thinking about R as a place to do genome scale statistics. Let's just talk about what we're going to be making use of in R. <clears throat> the two concepts that I think are worth bringing to the fore, no matter where you're working uh, in, in R, are the concepts of functional programming and object-oriented programming. They're really important for computer science scholars. How important are they for people who are doing bioinformatics? Uh, <clears throat> I think it's worth recognizing how easy it is to create a function in R you basically define a new variable and give it the value of function of some parameter, some argument. And in this case, we've written a function. We call it cube. That's a natural way of saying. What we're going to do is take a number x and take the third power. And so that's a little bit of R that we've written. And when we run it, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> so there we go. We were able to do it before but we're not able to do it now. That's okay. Uh, I have it running on my own machine. And uh, we'll just, I think I have it here. Local host, yes. So let us blow this one up a little bit and uh, keep going. We'll just use some R here to demonstrate. Ah, well, it's already done. Let's clear this cell. Oh, my goodness, everything is changing on me. Cell. 
I want to clear all outputs. Uh, I'm on mobile display, folks. <laughs> Just hang on a minute. Why is that? Yeah, I increase the font too much. All right. Well, anyway, here we go. Let's, let's run our cube function. You've already seen what it looks like. And, ah, <laughs> all right, this is fantastic. Let's run that bit of code first, which shows you already how to run cube before, and then we can come to this cell and run it again with a different uh, input, and we get the cube of seven. So we have defined a new piece of software called cube. It takes numerical arguments, and uh, it gives you the answer. Now, here's an exercise. Given the cube function, what's a concise way of defining a function that computes the ninth power? And if we remember our rules of arithmetic, we know that we can just take the cube of the cube, multiply the exponents, we get the ninth power. And this is another way of writing a new function. We make a function that is built up out of calls of other functions. And then we run this one. And we see, first of all, that when we run our function nin, we get a number called 262,144. And then we can also do that in primitive R notation, taking 4 to the ninth power, and we get the same answer. So this is a little bit of learning about R as a functional language. We can write new functions using this syntax, where we may have a number of parameters here. And then we define what we want to do with these parameters within these brackets. And this defines a new function, g, which accepts a series of arguments. The body of the function uses those inputs and R's syntax to compute new values. Okay? It's not very earth-shattering, but everything in R comes from evaluating functions of this type. So if you're an R user, you're familiar with those ideas, but I want to make sure we're all on the same playing field with respect to that aspect of R. <clears throat> now, one may want to ask, well, uh, if I know R, why do I need bioconductor? And uh, one of the reasons is that a bioconductor has used R to create a bunch of artifacts, packages, data objects, data structures, and so on, that help you do genome scale statistics. So Levi wrote this nice table that compares R to bioconductor. R is a general purpose. How did that happen? Ah, oh, somebody did something out there. You're all looking at this, and you can, you can actually modify my environment? No, this is my local one. Anyway, general purpose programming environment, bioconductor, goes and packages things up for bioinformatics. R is a decentralized open source project, but Bioconductor, I should have put more acknowledgments here, is funded by several NIH grants and has a core team of full-time developers. R provides mainly generic data structures. Bioconductor provides integrative data structures for dealing with things in the omics world. R is enhanced by 10,000 packages in the CRAN ecosystem Bioconductor has an ecosystem of 1,200 add-on packages that are quality controlled in a certain way that is not shared by CRAN. I won't go into that right now, but if people are interested in it, maybe by the end of the course, we'll talk about some of the approaches to quality control that characterize Bioconductor that I think are quite useful. Yes, CRAN enforces basic package requirements. Bioconductor has more requirements. In particular, we'll talk about something called a vignette for each package and the reuse of core bioconductor data structures. And then, yes, as you said, there are commercially supported versions of R. We have several NIH and European Commission grants that help us do this work. That's R and bioconductor compared in a nutshell, OK? So you have a reason for coming here. Now, how about the objects? We talked about functions for a minute. What's, what is an example of one of these objects that helps us do genome scale statistics? Well. There's a library called Homo sapiens, Homo dot sapiens to be precise. You have to use the dot. And uh, if you install that package and you run the methods function on class Homo dot sapiens, you see that there's a bunch of methods that have been defined for this entity. <clears throat> and if you Go over this list. Some of the uh, items are kind of dry, coerced. What would that be? But genes, five prime UTRs by transcript, um, three prime UTRs by transcript, microRNAs, and so forth. 
Those are interesting from a biological, bioinformatic perspective. What do those things do to Homo dot sapiens for you to work with your bioinformatic data analysis? Let's take a look. So let's run the genes. Let me run each one of these guys so that I don't get into trouble. Yeah. And we're going to run the genes method on Homo dot sapiens. <clears throat> Now, there's a lot of infrastructure that gets loaded up in order to help you do this, but finally, when the genes method returns its result, we get this thing. Now, some of you have used R, some of you have used Bioconductor. How many are familiar with G ranges? A modest number. Good. So, G ranges is one of the fundamental contributions of Bioconductor. We wrote a paper in PLOS Computational Biology a couple of years ago describing the infrastructure. And it's a, a highly efficient implementation of uh, an algebra for dealing with intervals uh, on the uh, natural numbers. So sets of integers that are ordered, and then we make subsets of them. That is a model for regions of the genome, and then the idea of a gene as a region of the genome that has a start, an end, and a strand, and also some metadata, like its entree gene ID, this is all assembled in this G-Ranges object, which comes back to you when you run genes on Homo sapiens. If you work on other model organisms, like Mus Musculus or Rattus nervegicus or whatever, we have objects of this type as well. You run genes on that, you get back a G-Ranges, same object type, you may have a different type of metadata about, about it, depending on what type of um, annotation was used to generate these addresses. But you get this very homogeneous approach to working with the collection of gene addresses for different types of organisms. Let's go a little bit further. <clears throat> the nice thing about these um, notebooks is that you can add new code Actually, I'll add a new cell here and just run some more code. Let's do seek info of homo.sapiens. You can see that <coughs> there are 93 sequences. <coughs> and the reason for that is that we have the ordinary chromosomes and then we have these more difficult to place sequences that are of biological interest that have been organized by the UCSC, uh, but they haven't been uh, placed on chromosomes uh, quite yet. Now notice also that we have labeled this as being from the HG19 genome. And we also have instances of annotation for HG38. But we don't have a homo dot sapiens, as far as I know, that deals with HG38. You have to know a little bit more to implement this homo dot sapiens for the more recent genome build than I will get to in this course. Okay, any questions or comments? It's pretty straightforward stuff. Kind of the most basic reason for getting involved in Bioconductor is that we can work with reference information about genes of different model organisms. Yes? Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, so you are supposed to be walking along yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you see anything when the kernel is died? If you keep scrolling through, do you at least see this text? Yeah. Yeah, the kernel is dead. So that's that's the issue we are having uh, with all the instances that we try to speed up the line is that it's not really working anymore. So um, we're trying to fix that and try to get an automated setup going so that if you just want to follow along, just follow the system. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. You can't make, no. This talk is, is being done on my machine. So you can do what you do, whatever you like. Let me comment on this a little bit. The first is that the failure has nothing to do with bioconductor. Um, and it's the kind of thing that happens when you're working with these cloud providers. It can happen for any reason whatsoever. And um, uh, I, I, I have a feeling we'll get through it uh, to, to have the desired environment. But what I think we're going to do 
is um, get each of you to have your own machine with an image of R on it that has all of the software that I'll be working through, and then you'll do things, but probably not through the Jupyter Notebook framework. And we'll talk about how to deal with that, okay? But right now, we're just gonna talk about some rather general issues that you don't necessarily have to be doing code in order to appreciate them, and then we'll see as the technical solution converges, uh, we'll see what to do uh, in terms of hands-on computing. <clears throat> all right. So to review, what we've shown is that with R and Bioconductor, you can improvise software in your session with user-defined functions. Uh, and then we also have these ideas of objects, and that's probably one of the more controversial things about Bioconductor itself. Back in 2000, there was a new object system introduced in R called S4, and we decided that we would use S4 to implement things like homo.sapiens and so on. And that is something that is objectionable to certain subgroups of the R development population. But we stuck with it, and I think it has paid off. So methods on objects uh, are ways of expressing high-level concepts about genomics, and that's what Bioconductor gives you. We're going to learn a lot about different types of objects and all the methods that apply to them in order to do things like differential expression analysis, network construction, and so forth. Okay, so those are <coughs> relatively nuts and bolts aspects of working with R and Bioconductor, but then there's this idea of library. And this is a somewhat complicated issue because if you don't know the name of the library that has the object or the functions that you're interested in, you may be in a bit of trouble. Not too much trouble because you can ask your friends uh, or you can ask the Bioconductor mailing list or you can do a certain type of search of the available software to find the thing that you thought you knew about. So we'll talk about ways of solving this problem, but it's very important to have a working memory of all the different libraries that give you software and data that you need to solve your problem. <clears throat> we might as well take a quick look at the Bioconductor website, just so that we're all on the same page there, bioconductor.org. Uh, so we'll blow the up the font a little bit. And if you haven't been here, it's worth spending a couple of, uh, couple of minutes uh, scrolling through. What I wanted to show you uh, is the support site. <clears throat> so there is here something which is very much like Biostars, which is a, a forum for questioning and answering uh, questions about bioconductor and genomics generally. And um, people uh, get credits for the solutions that they give, and, you know, we have scholars and teachers and so on. Uh, so this is a good place for coming, to, for coming for help. And you can also search the website uh, uh, as necessary to find things that you might be interested in. Uh, I'll mention also that the software <clears throat> is managed using uh, an ontology, so that all the software packages have these tags that lie in these high-level concept terms uh, that have been adopted here. So if you look, for example, what could biological question uh, mean, you can expand that and see that, well, there are packages that have labeled themselves as dealing with alternative splicing or driver mutation or functional prediction and so on. So there's a lot of help on the site to get you to the resources that you need. And um, when you have problems, go to the support site and tell people, this, this thing isn't working well enough for us, can't you improve it? Uh-huh. What's that all about? Okay, we don't want to deal with that. All right, here we are. So, library. Everything in R proceeds by evaluations of functions. You can write scripts, but they wind up being function calls. And for your own uh, strategic uh, awareness, um, here's an idea. Anything you do more than three times should be a function. And every function should be in a package. How many folks here have created a, an R package? Okay. It's not the hardest thing in the world to do. Making it relevant for your own research is something which is perhaps a bit of a challenge. Uh, I don't think we'll get into packaging here, but there's plenty of resources to help you do that. And this idea that you should think about function design for things that you do repetitively is one that's worth bearing in mind. <clears throat> so many ways of using software in R. You can write scripts and execute them at the command line. You can use RStudio. You can use R as a command line interpreter. We'll probably do a fair amount of that. 
You can use Jupyter Notebooks. And you can use R through online apps. Um, we won't get into that. That seemed a little too advanced for here. But if people have questions about that, come to me offline, and we'll show how to build shiny apps. We have some nice examples of that. So just to wrap up these very introductory remarks, um, yeah, data structures to work conveniently with genomes and genome scale data. So to parse, for example, the data that come out of microarray scanners or uh, sequencers, pre-process the raw data so that you have comparability across assay outputs that may need some statistical modification in order to be interpretable in a comparative way. Combine assay quantifications with sample level data. So you did an experiment. There are many different samples. You have to annotate them in order to structure the comparisons that you're going to uh, make in order to test your hypotheses. <clears throat> we'll talk about how to organize uh, this, this type of information uh, in a way that makes it more difficult to mismatch and have bioinformatic errors uh, because of the coordination structure that we've uh, adopted here. And finally, uh, we'll be reviewing objects and functions so that you can do all these things. <clears throat> so. Uh, one of the things we're not going to do here is uh, get into um, installing R. Once you've got R going, you can use this to get a version of the BIOC installer package that is appropriate for the version of R that you're using. And this idea of versions is actually very serious. Um, you should keep your R up to date, but it may be the case that you're working on a project that's taking years to complete and things change between versions of R, and you want to be able to work with the old version. That problem has been addressed in a number of different ways, and you can have parallel different versions of R on a machine, and you can switch between them conveniently. I'm not going to get into that, but I just want you to know that whatever version you're working on, you need to use the bioconductor software that is relevant to that version. You do not mix versions. Even though it can be done technically, it is a very bad idea. You will ultimately run into trouble. So you keep versions of R separate from one another, and you have the appropriate bioconductor for each one of those versions. Once you have it going, you can install a package. And this is an example of installing uh, a, a package that's relevant to a, an online course that we teach. Uh, and I'll just run this in my uh, shell here. Um, and I think what it's going to tell me here, it's kind of intelligent. I already installed it previously. And it checks to see whether the version that's in GitHub, this is in installing a package that is actually on, in a GitHub repository. Since it hasn't changed, it doesn't bother doing anything. So that is how easy it is to go and install packages that are perhaps in GitHub repositories. More likely, they're in the Bioconductor repository or in CRAN. And you use BIOC Lite to get the package and any other assisting packages that you may need. And there's plenty of help at the bioconductor site to do that. Yes? Can I chime in something that's kind of underappreciated? This BIOC light command, once you're using bioconductor, you can use it to install absolutely everything across CRAN and bioconductor and GitHub. And it is the recommended way to do it once you're using bioconductor. <coughs> Actually, I thought I would take issue with something up a little bit above where it said that, and I know I approved this too, but that library is an, a fun, is an essential, uh, yeah. is an essential, yeah, right there, to acquire access to functions and documentation and library components. There is an, another approach, the double colon. I don't know if you want to mention that to them. I, I have been encouraging more and more just to avoid loading entire namespaces yeah. and to make it clear which package functions come from. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting a little technical here. Um, certainly for programming, I think knowing about double colon is really important. But I guess the point that you're making here, let, let's, see, uh, let's see if we can make it live. D do you want to come up and, and demonstrate a, a working example of it? Sure. Okay. Uh, I'll make you a new cell. <laughs> uh, let's see. What's, an, what's a library that you have here? 
How about Lima? Lima. <clears throat> All right, so we can. I'll do the double question mark first just to see what some functions in Lima are. How about LM fit? Sit down. Okay. <laughs> like this? Yeah, just show the code. Just yeah. Okay. So. Okay, well, right. it ran. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the point is well made, but I, I think it's a little technical for what we want to get into. He's absolutely right. If you want to get access to a function, you do not need to use library to get access to the function. You can use the name of the package and the double colon and the function name. Um, and uh, we need to revise these notes to, to reflect that because uh, you're absolutely right. Um, I was hoping that you would just actually be able to see the code here. And that is often uh, worth doing. There it is. So um, again, nice thing about R is that it's open source. Nice thing about R is that when you're in R and you're running some function and you're concerned about what it does, you can print out the function code and see it. So here's a case where Levi's point I think is well made. You do not have to say library to pollute your namespace with all the functions in Lima if you want to just see what the LMFit code looks like. It's worth knowing. Now what I was in the middle of saying was that you can use question mark, not double question mark, to find out about functions that you may be interested in. And I thought it was very nice the way in which the Jupyter Notebook um, gives you access to the help. So it starts a new web uh, subpage, which gives you all the information here about the way in which mean is computed. And interestingly enough, this mean is coming from BioC generics. That's a package that uh, is created in Bioconductor uh, that deals with means somewhat more generally than R itself. So R, it's nice to go off topic, stats, mean. So let's see whether there's a mean function in stats. Not exported. So wh where do you think it is, base? Base. Yes, so, yeah. And you see how informative it is. So that we're now we're getting to something called S3 object-oriented programming. We're not going to take it any further. There. But I wanted to make sure that you saw that you could use, as Levi demonstrated, you can use double question mark to get help, which is going to search all topics for the string that you put the double question mark in. Or you can use question mark to generate a man page. Another very nice piece of R's functionality is the idea that you can have working examples in the uh, man pages for different functions. So if you're interested in understanding the LM, which is for linear modeling function of R, you can say example LM, and uh, uh, this code will be run for you, and it will show you how LM behaves. So here we are. We've run LM with a certain data set. We've regressed weight on group, and uh, we've done it again. And then there are some other methods going on. But ultimately, we have a plot of residuals and other diagnostics about the regression that has been fit. And that's all taken care of you by the example function. So I think those are nice features of R to get very familiar with. <clears throat> now let's try this one. Help package equals gene filter. Help type equal HTML. So here we are, package level documentation, which is essentially going to tell me who wrote the package, uh, what packages does it need, and what are the different functions that are defined in that package with some explanatory text. So many different ways of getting help in uh, R that I wanted to make sure we have had a look at. What about vignettes? 
So uh, again, a bioconductor package that we won't be visiting for some time, but I just want to illustrate this concept for you. And when you run the vignette function, you are taken to a man page or a PDF document that gives you a very careful description of how to use a package. Not just a function, but how to use many different functions in the package to do some biology. So this vignette function uh, is very powerful, and all bioconductor packages are required to have vignettes, and they look like this. They tell you how to go through an analysis. They may include graphics and so on. And uh, I just want to make sure that we don't, uh, we don't miss that concept there. Okay? That is the end of my discussion of bioconductor and installation and very general ideas. We can take a break. We can have some questions or discussion. Where's Ashok? Are we ready for a break yet? It's 9.34. Maybe I'll do a little bit more. Yeah. Okay? And then we'll take a break. Maybe in 9.45. You've got it going? I think so. <laughs> All right. Let us talk a little bit about data management and uh, data structure for genome scale experiments. And then we'll take a break, and hopefully everything will be running, and then we can all do these things uh, jointly on the notebooks. So data structure and management. Who likes data management? Uh, what did I say here? It's often regarded as a specialized and tedious dimension of scientific research. Uh, and then, because failures of data management are extremely costly in terms of resources and reputation, highly reliable and efficient methods are essential. So I don't know why anybody, nobody raised their hand. So the customary lab science practice of maintaining data in spreadsheets. How many are using Excel to do your scientific data? It's okay. You can say. Yeah. It's regarded as risky. We want to add value to our data by making it easier to follow reliable data management practices. So what I'd like to do is have you be able to make the choice between Excel and something else, maybe Bioconductor, for managing scientific data in ways that take you more reliably and in a more streamlined way through to the scientific inferences that you want to make. Okay? It's not free. You have to learn about these structures. You have to understand their justification. But that's the hope, that you'll at least be able to weigh the options. So here's some more stuff. Bioconductor, principles that guide software development are applied in data management. So data structures that are modular and extensible. So if you think of a good way of managing microarray data, and then some other technology comes along, maybe you can reuse that structure, which is already known to have good properties, to have the metadata tightly bound to the assay data and so on. So this idea of modularity and extensibility, Bioconductor really hangs a lot of value on that. Packaging and version control protocols apply to data structure definitions. So you have a good idea about how to manage a microarray, but then a few months go by and people think, well, I think we should put some other things on it. We stamp the new approach with a version. We have the old approach has a version. And you know what you're getting when you get the object. Motivate and illustrate these ideas by giving examples of transforming spreadsheets to semantically rich objects working with GEO and dealing with families of BED and BAM files. And then maybe we would even think about how to work with something like TCGA as a, as a unified entity. How many people are working with TCGA? Just a few. OK, the Cancer Genome Atlas, cancer biology, cancer genomics. Uh, many people do have to confront it, and maybe in your future you will as well. OK. So let's talk about a spreadsheet approach, and then we'll talk about a bioconductor approach. Let me see whether I, yes. This is what we're going to get to. OK, so I want us all to be on the same page with respect to the, the thing we're trying to solve. OK, so 
Microarrays. How many people are interested in microarrays? A reasonable number of you. How about sequencing, RNA-seq? More. Okay. You're younger than me. <laughs> All right. Doesn't matter which, okay? You have done N of your RNA-seqs or your microarrays, right? What is N? N is the number of separate, biologically separate samples. Okay? There may be some replication structure in there. We'll ignore that for now. We'll say there are N samples. I need to manage them somehow. Okay, so I have an array. I have a matrix, really. There are G features. Okay, it might be the number of probes on the microarray. It might be the number of intervals that you decided to pile up your reads in. Whatever it is, those are the features of your samples that you're going to measure uniformly across the samples. At least that's your intention, to get G features on each one of these samples. So I get this G by N matrix, whatever you want to call it, and the IJ element is the ith feature on the jth sample measured by your assay. Okay, well, Excel takes care of that. Nice spreadsheet. Anything you want, we have this G by N matrix that we will interrogate using indices I and J. Well, there's more than that because with each one of these N samples, I've recorded some information. What treatment was used, what was the batch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There may be as many as R features of each sample that I want to record. And usually, these are a little more involved than just real numbers. They could be categorical. It could be a sex. It could be some intricate representation of a, a, a protocol identifier, what have you. These are attributes of the samples, and they must be managed in a coordinated way. Sometimes I may want to just get all the data, let's say, on the controls. So I want to know which of the samples are controls, and then get only the assay results for those. I want to be able to do something like that. The information on which is a control and which is treated is maintained in this other object. All right? How do we coordinate these things? And how do we also keep, think, keep track of things like, well, I have feature names here. What are those feature names? Are they gene names, gene symbols? Are they probe IDs from a microarray? Are they ensemble IDs? How do I tell people what these tokens are? And how do I bind other information about the features or the experiment or whatever into an object so that there's this coordinated, coherent thing that represents all this information? If it's spread out a bunch of, bunch of, uh, uh, over a bunch of, of spreadsheets, there are more opportunities for error in merging things, linking them together ad hoc. We want one coordinated bundle for this type of information. Is that clear? That's what I'm going for here. So we're going to use all the things I talked about with respect to R and Bioconductor to do that coordination. And here's an example of the uncoordinated data. And we'll finish with the uncoordinated data, then take the break. So the uncoordinated data come out of this package, GSE 5859. <clears throat> you can go in GEO and find it. But they took a subset of it to teach the course. And what do you have? Well, we have that matrix. G is 8793, N is 24. There's a matrix of gene expression numbers. And the Jupyter Notebook prints it out very nicely, right? Well, these are the sample names, and these are the feature identifiers. Now, some of you who are older will recognize those feature identifiers as Affymetrix probe IDs, but their real interpretation would depend upon which array they're associated with, so you want to know that. But that's the gene expression data. The other piece that I talked about, which was the N by R, is this sample info table, and as you can see, you have complicated data structures there. There may be a file name, there may be tags for ethnicity, and there could be some numerical data in there as well. So you don't want to use a matrix to represent that. You want something like a data frame. So this is the sample information. These file names would associate with the column names of the assay data. So that would be a good thing. Actually, let's check that. This is a little bit of R to check it. Check that the file name is always equal to the column name of the gene expression, element by element. And that turns out to be true. Okay? The other thing that I uh, didn't talk about much was, well, you may want to have annotation about those genes. 
bound to these data. So the, these are the probe IDs, but there's more interesting information in the symbols that are um, mapped. <laughs> and that is actually a dynamic process of saying which gene a given probe uh, interrogates. <clears throat> so these are more complications that we try to take care of for you. <clears throat> and so you have to understand R to work with each one of these things separately. And for example, we have a little exercise here. Tabulate the ethnicity for the samples in this data set. So in order to do that, you just use the table function. You can get the ethnicity out of it using a dollar sign. That's just a data frame syntax. And we see that there are 24 people. 23 of them are of Asian uh, ethnicity. One of them is from Europe. And the type of code that you would use in order to compare expression values for uh, a given gene is something like this. I have to take the gene expression data, find the row that corresponds to PAX8, and then split the data on that gene by group, and uh, then make a box plot. So that's doable, and that's how many people do their work. Right? You write the right function on the right data, and you get the comparison that you're interested in. Okay, what we will do, we have the exercise then. How would you do this for DDR1? You have to go back here and substitute in two places the gene symbol that you're interested in. And that can be done. All right? So now the question is, how are we going to unify these tables using expression sets in Bioconductor? And that will be the thing that we do after the break. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so I think we can get you all ready uh, up and doing, especially thought since exercises are up here, that it's probably important for you to follow along. Um, this is going to be a slightly a little different format than what we've done before. Um, because of the way this turned out. So really what we want you to do actually right now this should actually be working for most of you. Should add a cell here so No. That'll be the <laughs> second one will be So, could half the people in the room raise your hand, please? Half? Yeah. <laughs> Countdown. One, two, one, well, two. Let's do this. Um, so, I guess yeah. this side we'll probably go with um, all of you just log in into this ID. And so just put that up in your browser bar. I think you need another dot there. Yeah. yeah. And on the right, so I'll get there, and that'll be the password. Um, so does everybody get, did everybody get into the login screen? Yep. It's not. Oh, just one colon. So, yeah. um, may I have an extra one here? Oh. So that was the first one. Uh, the second one should be 
Fine, right? Is everybody on the right side in? All right. So now when you log in, what you will come is you will come to a page oh, that shows better, right there. all your notebooks. But you have to put it in the browser. Put it in the... Um, so yeah. everybody will open okay, up not put in one notebook and save it in with your name. Uh-huh. Everything working okay? Make a copy and then you can change the name up here to for instance, this would be and that would be the notebook you'd be working with. You have to put it in the browser bar. Yeah, yeah so if you go if you go back, so the moment you logged in, it should come to the home page. So first, is everybody logged into the page? Do they all have the home page? Great. So once you click on the period one IPI and B, right? And then you go to file and say make a copy. Okay? And then it'll open up another page with your notebook and you know add your name to that. And that's the one you'll be working with. Um, I'm sorry to be rude before. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, namespace pollution is a good topic. So, uh, okay. 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 So you're getting this, you're getting the same notebooks individually. Yeah, so we so we launched two big instances yeah. with all the pastors to do it yeah. and then have their own notebooks. And okay. you have your own your instructor one. Okay. So for some reason Andrew needs to be logged into the mission. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. can't just have No, he needs to have an SSH connection live. For the notebook, for the notebook, which we don't know why, when they change, why they change. So that's, that's what's been. So now, right now, we're like, I don't know, I have logged in. So your instructor stuff works fine too if you want to use that. Uh, All right. That would be the one. Okay. Does anybody not have the connection that they need? No? Okay. So why don't we start again at um, 10 o'clock? That sound good? Well, how about 10-10? Um, I, I want to thank Ashok. And yeah, we've got some new toy here. Yep. Uh, so this is a catch mic. Um, as you're all as you're all aware, you're on camera, so you know, make sure you smile. Um, and because we're recording this, if you have any questions, let us know and we'll throw this at you and then you can ask your question into it and then once you have your answer, you can throw it back to us. Let's see how um, safe this is. Mm. They hit me in the glasses, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to throw this around too much. Yep. Uh, but we'll try to come closer and um, walking around. Um, again, you know, the, the notebooks are working and some of you are having trouble getting the commands to, might have trouble getting the commands to run and maybe taking a long time or something. Try to see if you can refresh your browser at this point. Um, and if not, we will try to spin up more instances and kind of move people over as, um, as we progress along. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm actually, I want to run all of this locally in my computer in my own art studio. Yep. 
Um, I'm wondering about GSC 5859. Where would I get that package? Okay. Good question, and it gets a good answer. Okay. I'm going to scroll down because I think we took care of this. Um, it, it's, it's a very nice feature of Bioconductor. That, or actually, I should say, it's a nice feature of install.packages in R. And if you use this syntax to specify the package name, it will assume that this is a GitHub repository, and it will go to GitHub and get the package for you. Okay? There's some more packages in the second one that are like that. Everyone that won't install, they're all in genomics class. So if I install genomics class, I'll just do the whole thing? No. You have to be package by package. It's a pull request if you figure out how to do that. I have to say the caveat for getting those packages is downloading dev tools, which may be a little bit more involved if you want to um, get it to actually um, need some other libraries. Yes, it can be a nightmare, actually. <laughs> get to R. Whoa, whoa. All right, that's not Bioconductor. <laughs> now, um, let's review where we've been. We had some nice tables here. And I'm, I'm really thankful to Ashok for tuning me into these, um, these Jupyter notebooks because this type of rendering uh, is quite attractive and it comes for free. Any data frame that you want to show like that uh, comes out very nicely. <clears throat> but we are not happy about the fact that this data is spread out over all these different objects. And so we're going to think about expression sets. And these are passe. <laughs> we didn't really adapt them to doing RNA-seq, which everybody is so interested in. But you have tons of expression data out in GEO, and uh, they will come to you as expression sets for the, not foreseeable, for the foreseeable future. And so it's good to know the principles underlying expression set and how to work with it. So as I said before, G by N table records gene expression values, and an N by R table records the sample information. Now, uh, I guess the links on these fine um, new books that you have are not worked out, but um, what I had for you here is the, the picture uh, that we saw before. So that picture is out there somehow, but they didn't work out the links into the new notebooks, I think. No problem. Um, we want to put these all together in one object. And the way we do that is we use expression set. So you bring in library biobase. You should have this code in your notebook. ES5859 is an expression set function call with the argument assay data equals gene expression. That's the matrix of G by N numbers. And what we've done here is created ES5859. And then we're going to bind in there the sample info data frame using the p-data. So this is very peculiar syntax now. We've talked about function calls, and that one should make sense. But what about this? We have a function call followed by an equal sign. Okay? This can be done. And it is because everything in R is a function call. So even these assignments can be written as function calls, and all this does is rearrange things so that this object gets updated so that it has a p-data component that is equal to this data frame. If you didn't follow that, don't worry about it. It will work. And it will give you a much nicer thing than the sprawling tables in your environment that you started out with. So let us break this up a little bit. <clears throat> now there's a nice thing in um, these Jupyter notebooks that allow you to split up these cells. And so we can run them one at a time. You don't have to do this, but I'll, I'll just show you the pieces as we go piece by piece. So what is ES5859 at this point? Oop, gene expression not found. So I have to keep running all of my code. Sorry about that. You have to run um, a little bit here assuming that you installed it from the, the task before. This should work. 
and now this little uh, expression set event should work right here. Let's do this one as well. Okay, so I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit. I'm sorry about this. Uh, and we've changed the modality a little bit. So let's go step by step through this one more time. We will start here and make sure everybody succeeds with this. Library GSE 5859 subset, and we run a data command that gets us that a number of data sets, gene expression, gene annotation, and sample info. Has that worked for everybody? I don't have as many of those. That's OK. This is, this is my personal thing. There's a bunch of stuff. But as long as you have those three, you're in good shape. Gene expression, gene annotation, and um, sample info. Sampling. Okay? As long as you have those three things, we can keep going. So then we're going to take the dimensions of gene expression and find that it has 8,793 probes. We look at some of them and we see the values for the different columns. Everybody with me? I see a lot of heads nodding, so I'm going to assume yes. If you have a problem, please let me know. Okay. The sample info is a table. And the gene annotation is another table. We are going to check that the sample info file name is coordinated with the column names of gene expression. If they were permuted in any way, that would be a problem. That would tell me that my sample data is not coordinated with the assay data. And then we do another little example here to tabulate the group variable. This exercise just makes sure that you know how to tabulate ethnicity, how to get the ethnicity variable out of a data frame. And this one is an illustration of box plotting for a given gene. And the exercise would have been to say, OK, come down here show that you can substitute for a new gene symbol. So let's do a, new, a different gene. Let's try BRCA2. I don't know if it's on the array, but we can give it a try. I don't mind if there's an error, but there it is. It's nice to see errors, because then you can see me recover from errors, and that's something that is good for learning. But we didn't need to, we didn't have an error here. Let's make an error. Let's make a gene that doesn't exist. What happens? There you go. OK? So when this kind of thing happens, you have errors. There's a, there's a, there are ways to respond to it when the function calls are more complicated. You can run a debugger. I won't go into that now. But it's good to know that um, when you have an error, this guy doesn't die. But you can just fix the error. You know, well, I forgot. Let me try BRCA1. Maybe there's a BRCA1. Yes. OK. So these are very forgiving notebooks. You can throw errors, and then you can fix them up, and you keep going. OK. So that's a little bit of improvisation. There. And now we're going to get to this point where I'm splitting up some of the tasks here. The first thing I need to do, I'm going to split this up. And uh, right here, we will split again. We will look at sample info. And let's evaluate sample info. Notice that the row names of sample info are these integers. That's not good. When we put our things together, we want to have row names that correspond to the column names of the assay that we're going to bind this to. And that's why I run this command here. I'm just going to put the row names. And that's that strange syntax that I talked about before, where you can evaluate a function on the left-hand side of an equal sign. This happens a lot in Bioconductor. Don't be afraid of it. If we now go and print the value of sample info, you will see that we now have nice row names. They're better than these anyway, okay? 
So that's what we've got there. Now, how about with a gene annotation? Let's look at that. Split this in. What's better? Ah, okay. Let's try and find out why. What kind of errors are you seeing? I think you're just not seeing any results, but it is running. So when we get to the next stages, when we print out some values, you'll get this. So here we are. This is gene annotation, a very long table. And I'm just going to pop in the row names to be the probe ID. OK, I'm hearing a lot of rumbling and so on. I am improvising a little bit to show you the background of each one of these calculations. But um, we'll get back to the track. Everybody on track now, or is there a big question, a few questions that we should take from the audience? What we really want you to be is here, evaluating ES5859. Yes? You can throw. That's OK. Um, if you don't change the row names, yes. does, uh, what happens when you try to make the big uh, do the library bio base thing? That, that's a great question. Let's, let's try it out, OK? So what I can do here is say row names of gene expression equals null. OK, let's try it. The row names are gone. It still works. It's a little different, though. Let's go back over here to our friend. Let's look at this carefully, OK? If you look at this expression set, um, it doesn't look any different. But let's keep going. There are no row names there. When I put in the sample info, that seems to work as well. So it doesn't seem to penalize us too much for not doing that. But this is a way of just ensuring that the, the metadata are there. OK, so what we've done now is we've bound in the gene annotation here. and. We have a more extensive report because the FINA data has sample names, it has variable labels, label description, and also we bound in this feature data, which gives us all of these probe IDs. It tells us that there's also information on symbols and so forth. And this is a very rich annotation of those three tables that we started out with. And what that enables us to do is to take advantage of that unification and reliably create something like a function called two sample plot, which takes an expression set as an input, a stratification variable, which will define the two groups, a symbol of a gene that I'm going to want to compare distributions on, and then another parameter, which is a little obscure, but has to do with the fact that sometimes there are multiple probes for a given gene on the, on the microarray, and you have to pick one of them in order for this to make sense. So this little function works with the F data to find out which gene we're working on, the P data, the, the sample data, to figure out how to split the data into the different strata. And finally, uh, it has some labeling for the uh, box plot. <clears throat> Let's see how this function works. We're going to run it, grouping, and running it on bracket 2. Ah. So now we have an error. And I think the reason is that I took away the row names of the gene expression. So let's put it back. 
There are certain things that require those names to be there as we build this through. So I'm going to rerun all of these little commands here. I have sample info here. And now I'll just step through each one of them. But I will not set the row names to no. There we go. So th there's a place where it helps to have those things in there because of the way I wrote this up. Um, and there we are. We have a function now for BRCA2. And if you want to change the gene that you're going to plot, let's say DDR1, you can just change the name of the gene and run your function again, and you get a different comparison. So what we're trying to do is motivate the use of an expression set to put all the data together and understanding the components of the expression set so that you can write a function that does something that's of interest to you. I'm not expecting you to be able to write these functions at this time, but this is really a motivational um, set of remarks. Okay? Now here's a very nice uh, additional thing we can do. There's a nice library called Annotate. And if you have a PubMed ID of a paper that's relevant to some data that you have, you can go and run the PMID to Miami function. Let's do that. <clears throat> Again, I'm, I'm just going to split this up so that we can see what's going on. Uh, can you say how you're splitting? Oh, yeah. You do shift control minus where you want to split. Put the cursor someplace and then do shift control minus and it will split. And then when you run this cell, you now have this entity called MI, which I will evaluate. This is a new object. It's the Miami. Minimum information about a microarray experiment schema populated by information about the paper that this experiment was derived from. <coughs> so a 145 word abstract is also kept with this object. So what's happened here is R has gone out to NCBI, taken this PubMed identifier, made a query to PubMed, and pulled back a bunch of XML that describes the paper that we have the PubMed ID for. And then we can bind that into our expression set and that way, anybody who we hand this off to has information about the PubMed ID. And you can also run the abstract command on that to derive the abstract. So that is living now inside this entity, this expression set, ES5859. I don't know about you, but that's a type of data management that I think is worth doing. Because when I hand this thing off to somebody, they can learn a lot about the underlying experiment just with that object. Okay? So that's the motivation there. Any questions, comments about this? Yes? Ah. Yes. I think you're referring to okay. something. <laughs> Let me see. Mm -hmm. it, it has to do with the libraries being attached as you bring in some software. Is that what happened? Yeah. 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 So, it, you know, just to illustrate that, I'm going to just run into the terminal here because the, the notebook is, is slightly different. But if I say, for example, library here, annotate. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that comes out, right? This is R telling you, oh, you want to annotate, but you have to get all these other things in order for annotate to work. If you don't like that, you can do it another way. You can say, well, Lev Levi has one way. So suppose I say annotate colon colon PMID to Miami. You can get the function. You'll notice it's kind of slow, but you, the, the function will come, and you didn't have to see all that junk, right? You can also do the following. Uh, suppress package startup messages. And you put an expression in there. Library annotate, and then you, you won't see those. The yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so there's another way of taking care of that problem. It's not really a problem, it's just verbosity. But it's not just, actually a problem. No. Okay? All right. Good.
So adding some metadata about publication origins. I love it. Now, let us uh, use NCBI Geo to retrieve an experiment. <clears throat> this is a wonderful package called GeoQuery. It's by Sean Davis and some colleagues at NCI. Library GeoQuery. And um, this is going to be sort of the, uh, the wind-up of this, this, um, this session. We're going to go into Geo. We have a, a GSE. How many folks have worked with Geo before? I don't want to go too fast here, but it's, it's kind of de rigueur for computational biologists that um, there's you know thousands of micro experiments sitting in the internet through the gene expression omnibus, and they have these identifiers called uh, Geo series identifiers. And it just so happens that this is a Geo series identifier for a study of glioblastoma. Uh, tumor cells. So let's go ahead and run it. I mean, we've already put up with a lot of stuff. So let's run it and hope that hope for the best. And again, you see verbosity here. It's telling you that we're setting some options, we're getting some things back. I hope you see this. Depending on the system that you're using, uh, it, it, it should it should work. But it takes a little while uh, to process uh, the data. And so you can see here, I'm trying to evaluate this expression set. There it is. It's ready. So I'll wait for you folks. Has anybody succeeded in evaluating glioma yet? You have already. Okay. Good. So people on one host have succeeded with this. Just get a feel for what's out there. You go to GEO, you see that there's some experiment related Question. to an experiment that you're interested in. Yes. Uh, it's, it's more help than anything. Uh, I'm trying to use that function, but it's not letting me down. It's, it's finding the files. It's being unhelpful in terms of downloading it. What's the error message? Uh, it just says error in downloading file. How many people have seen that? So, so let's just make sure we appreciate what's going on here. You're just giving an identifier here. This function is setting up query to Geo to pull down information about this experiment. It may fail because your disk is full. It may fail because you don't have permission, and so on and so forth. I don't want to deal with those things right now. But I do want to get it, and I want you to see that there's now an expression set here. Let's see what's in there. There are 12 samples. How many features are there? 49,395. So this comes from a certain microarray that is GPL15207. It's one of the AFI arrays. I don't remember exactly which one it is. I think it's prime view, actually. So here you go. You've got the data all managed for you. And if you use the fdata function on this, you'll get the feature data that GEO provides for you. And it's really quite extensive. Right? The feature data is about each probe individually. It tells you about the RefSeq transcript ID, the protein ID, Swiss prod, and so on. That's all bound into the experiment for you. You don't have to go looking up what's the association of this tag with some annotation. Right? That's good. Then it tells you about the actual samples. And what's important here is that there's this sort of standardized notation about what's on the microarray, what type of samples there were. There are controls. Uh, why do they say that? Yeah, 24. I'm only printing out the controls. But there are also some that are treated with this tr drug, LXR623. Uh, so 12 samples, 6 are controls, 6 are treated. Yes? Uh, so I was just wondering, like, how, um, how consistent are these kind of annotations across geo data sets? And are they, like, provided by submitters, or are they required yes, before that's submitting? Yes, uh, that's a good question. I don't really have a definitive answer to that. They're pretty standardized. What you can see here is an artifact of the early stage of microarrays, which where there were two channel arrays. Channel 1 was red and channel 2 was green. Well, that doesn't really play out anymore, but they, they reuse these terminologies, these terms, so that there's a consistent annotation across data sets. So it's somewhat consistent, but you can't always rely upon the ability to easily say, oh, this was a control sample. You have to go in there. You may have to do some parsing, some string changes, whatever, to find out which one 
is control and to label it in that way? Good question. And many people have complained to GEO about trying to do that better, and I think they decided that they did the best they could. <laughs> and there have been several projects. I don't know, do you know any of these GEO re-annotation projects? I mean, some people have tried to curate. I mean, you've curated TCGA, for example. It's a big job to get uniform terminology across them. Some people do it, and then when they make it public, everybody can use it. But GEO itself has never been able to. They, they have their GEO data sets curated, but that's like one more. So it's a fraction of GEO, yeah. yeah. Um, you do have to do some custom, some geo set specific programming. It may work for a family of geos, ge geo experiments, but yeah, you basically are never going to get away with just what comes off the press. Here. What about the geo sets that are in SRA? Are they standardized to the NCBI or are they still, still a little There messy? are standards, but they don't get you to the semantics that you need most of the time. You have to do some work to get them. is picking small subsets of GEO and of SRA and standardizing them, and it's a lot of work. Yeah, I would guess the curated metagenomic is mostly it's SRA. It's right? all yeah. SRA. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're interested in those data resources, we have experts here who can describe that situation to you. The question is, for people who are thinking futuristically, how can NIH go further in making the data? They want it to be public, right? It's all out there. How can you make it easier to, to work with these things? And there's this idea of a genomic data commons where many more standards would be imposed and you'd be able to do a lot more things without all this nuts and bolts work. And that is some time down the road, but learning about genomic data commons and contributing to it would be relevant if those are concerns of yours. <clears throat> so the, the upshot to this is that um, we can do our plots again <clears throat> using this function to sample plot we have to know the names of the variables that we want to work on. So treated with colon CH1 is the representation of the drug or control. And the gene that I'm interested in, in this case, is ABCA1. And that was reported as one of the targets of this LXR623. OK? Now, there's an exercise. <clears throat> Yeah. This exercise is real. So let's see how you do with this. Let's see if we can understand the, the, the formulation of the exercise. Our plot, this plot here, does not fully respect the design of the experiment. There are normal and glioblastoma-derived cells, but all we did was say, if you're treated, then get one box plot, and if you're untreated, get another there's actually a cell type stratum in there that we didn't deal with. So the exercise is to look at this little table here. Now here I have to reduce the font a little bit so you can see this more clearly. So I can make a two by two table that shows the layout. It's not just two by six. It's two by two with three replicates inside each one of the cells. All right? And your job is to use two sample plot to compare only the normal astrocytes with respect to expression of ABCA1. Only the normal, but compare treated and control, right? Not a well phrased. Compare. So that's the problem. And I've set it up for you a little bit. This is going to be a markdown. There it is. I've set it up for you so that you, all you really have to do is get something in here that accomplishes it. And the question is, do you know enough about R and Bioconductor to do that at this point? I'm not sure I could do it. I'm going to wait one minute, and I'm going to let somebody tell me how to do it, and then I will start doing it. 
cell type. Okay, I'm going to um, I'm going to break this up into pieces. So first of all, we're going to do something to this expression here. Am I going to do something to this part or this part? Left of the comma or right of the comma? Right. Right of the comma. Everybody agree with that? Why? Remember. And, you know, I didn't really dwell on this very much. So I'm glad you got it, but uh, I think there's, there's a need to focus more on what this structure is really like when you're using brackets. It's like an array. It's like a matrix. This part refers to the rows, the features, the genes on the array. This part refers to the samples. So the problem says, I want to only deal with these samples. Therefore, I need to do something with this part of the expression. Okay? It's a way of subsetting an a, um, expression set that is relevant here. Now, the next question is, what variable should I use in order to change this part of the expression? It's not easy because the semantics are so strange. It's this variable here. Okay, so I'm going to take this and copy it. That's the nice thing about these, uh, these things. I can copy that there. And now I've got this vector of treatment types. And the only ones I want to use are the normal astrocytes. Well, again, I need to use some R syntax. I need to use a double equal sign. And then this is the value of the variable that I want to use. I just put that string in there, and now I push run and hope for the best. Didn't work. Okay. So, what could have gone wrong? I'm trying to change my glioma here. So let's see. I'm going to take this out and see whether the error is in this part of the expression. So let's make a new plot, a new cell and put this in here. The claim is that that should uh, give me a new expression set with just a smaller number of samples. And indeed it does. That gets me to six samples. Is this clear what's happening now? I started out with 12 samples, both normal and glioblastoma derived, and now I am just with six, only the normals. So that part is good. What's wrong? Stratfor. So let's just re reassign this guy here. So this is, uh, we'll call this what? Norm. Okay, we'll save that. And that's, a, that's a new expression set. I should be able to just run on norm here. So it's a new expression set. I'm going to just try and run it there. And uh, it probably will fail because I haven't really done anything new. There's some error here. So what must it be? There's something about this treated with. Ah, what could it be? Sorry about this. So norm treated Treated with colon CH1. Is that okay? 
Yes. But it isn't. Um, yes. So there are three controls and three treated. So that variable should be working as a stratification variable. Uh, so I must confess that um, I'm not getting the exercise right here. We'll have to figure this out. Oh, I think it. No. Okay, so let us take this into, it's really hard to know what to do here. I'll have to work on this another time. It worked for you. You have a comma one at the end? Yeah, that I put in just recently. I have a typo? Yeah, here it is. Think I'm good? I did something wrong. <laughs> I'm glad it works for you, <laughs> and um, uh, I hope the principle is clear. Uh, I would run the debugger here and find out where it's failing, but um, I don't think I can do that. Okay, so that brings us pretty much to the close of this part one. And we were saying we would take uh, nine, I think we're on time, expression sets unify our sample level data, the experts F data and E data are useful here, geo query can be used, and um, we haven't gotten into the alternative to expression set, but we will eventually. So any comments or questions? Right. Sorry about that mess up at the end, but it was life. OK, let us start period two, and then we will take a break after we get our bearings. <clears throat> so you go back to your original um, the thing that you first, you should have a, a tab called home. Oh yeah, you want to save your, your original period one. Yes, yes, that's right, okay. So do a save and checkpoint. Uh, remember how to do that, you can click on file and hit save and checkpoint. And then when you go to period two, you're going to want to save a, a new, make a copy. <coughs> So this one is on my machine. You will do a file, make a copy, and put your name on it. Okay. Go ahead and get that ready, and I'll be back. Uh, I'll be back in a minute. is um, working with general genomic features. This is a pretty, uh, this may seem somewhat dry, but uh, ultimately uh, it has great value. So the first thing you can do, Make sure you have your own copy. <laughs> I'm hearing a lot of rumbling, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to take questions if there are complications. I don't know whether you're going to get the, the figure here, but this figure is fundamental. What I want you to do is think of this uh, diagram as a, these are bases on a chromosome. And um, we're going to define a certain range. Uh, we color pink here. It's base 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And we're going to call that IR. That's our first I ranges. And what we want to do is understand these operations. Shift IR minus 2 takes this interval, 
and moves it two bases to the left. The narrow IR will take some argument, such as start or end, and it will tell you whether you want to narrow it um, uh, using a starting position of the second position, or at the end you want to narrow it so that you only go up to position 5 in the interval. We have a function called flank, which has parameters start and both. So if start is true, but both is false, then the flank is this. Actually, they should also have a width of 3. It's missing from here. Um, but the flank, the three, basing, the three base flank that has both equal to false will move, it, it occupies the three bases that are not part of the range to the left. And you can also have a flank that is at the end that is to the right. And then you, when you set flank with both equal true, then the flank will occupy both the part that is out of the range and also within the range. If we multiply a range by some number, we will be narrowing it. We're zooming in. This original one was width 6. When we multiply by 2, we get a new range of width 2. If we multiply by a negative number, we are zooming out. If we add, we are simply increasing the um, extent by the number added. And if we subtract, we are reducing linearly. Okay? And then we have a nice resize function, which will resize to uh, a subinterval of a given width. And you can learn about all these things, all the detailed parameters, by using the help function. So we can start by defining our I ranges. IR is this entity here, starting at position 5 and ending at position 10. It has a width of 6 because it includes these positions. And then when we shift it or resize it, we get these results. Okay? So this is something you just have to internalize. Ultimately, you're going to be doing things like finding overlaps between SNPs and genes and so on, and these operations will be all under the hood. We want to give you some of the basics. Now, it's very easy to define, as I showed you before, a collection of ranges which could, for example, model the genes on the genome on a given chromosome, let's say. In this case, we just define a bunch of starts, ends, and we are told the widths as well. And if we use the resize command on that collection of ranges, it's applied element-wise. OK, so I've resized each one of these to be size 1. And because the defaults are taken, it just takes the starting interval and gives me back that. How about if I made it a resize of 2? What would the width be? Everything has width 2. Okay? And IR is just the original interval that we started out with. Okay? Now, interrange operations. This is one way of looking at IR. Each one of our intervals has been plotted as a block on this range or this domain, you might say. OK, so here we are. We have these blocks here. And each one of them is a range from the IR object that I talked about before. So we plot IR to see this like this. And those of you who are working in RNA-seq may say, oh, well, this looks kind of familiar. This is kind of like a pileup of the reads that I aligned to the genome. So now we're starting to see some applications. There's an operation called reduce, which will just project all the occupied spaces into one contiguous occupation and leave empty spaces alone. Okay, so that's what the reduce operation does. It takes the complexity of this collection of ranges and simplifies it by taking all the overlapping entities and just treating them as one contiguous region. There's also an operation called disjoin, which preserves all the breakpoints that were present in the original collection of intervals. So that adds complexity to what you have. 
And then finally, there's gaps. So you can imagine that this could be, let's say, a, a collection of exons for a given gene. And then the gaps would be the introns. So that's why these operations were defined. And they're implemented very efficiently. OK? Now, here is some code for working with these um, ranges in a more familiar way in the sense that we can put names on them. Just as with R, we can take a vector of numbers and assign a character name to each one of them, we can do the same with our ranges. So what I've done here is that I've got seven ranges. I'm going to use the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G to name those ranges. And then I can select from them using names. Right? So this is associative memory. I can use the names or I can use the positions for this vector type thing. And I get back the range that I was interested in. Not only that, but it may be the case that I have some other metadata that I want to associate with each one of these ranges. And this is a somewhat contrived example, but all I've done is taken a data frame, which has some numeric variables in it, and assigned that as the mcols of my original collection of ranges. So the mcols is just this part. And then I'm going to say, well, I'm going to associate a row in my data frame with each one of these ranges. And I get this more unified object of metadata and range information in IR. It's been updated to include some additional variables. If I then operate on it with one of these intra-range operations like resize, that's fine. The metadata gets propagated along, but the ranges have been shrunk according to the resize operation. If, on the other hand, I want to look for the gaps in this set of ranges, it's not clear what you would do with the metadata here, so it goes away. And this little piece here is telling you that there are lots of methods defined for the class I ranges, 300 of them. So there's a lot that you could learn. You don't have to learn them all. But developers have created many different approaches to working with these ranges, and all of them get used in bioconductors uh, activities. Now, um, it turns out that we put the code in here, I guess, for the solutions for these exercises. But let's just look at this syntax, make sure we're comfortable with it. Write the code to determine the maximum width of ranges corresponding to six cylinder cars. OK, let's see how we would do that. Here's our unified object. We want to pick out the elements that have six cylinders. So that's this one, this one, this one, and that one. And then find the maximum uh, width of those intervals. Actually, we're talking about the original intervals here. So let's look at the syntax here. Write the code to determine the maximum width of ranges corresponding to six cylinder cars. Take the M calls, pick out the cylinder variable, Check that it's equal to 6. For those entries, take the width of the IR that satisfy that condition, and then get the maximum. OK? That's R. That's our user-friendly language. And here, show that the average value of miles per gallon for cars corresponding to ranges with start values greater than 14 is 18 something or other. Do it again. IR is like a vector. So inside the brackets, I can put an expression that satisfies this condition that the start, which is another method on I ranges, it just pulls out the start values. If start is greater than 14, I want to keep those ranges, take their miles per gallon out of their metadata, and compute the mean. <clears throat> okay? So the syntax is a little uh, bothersome, but that is how you would solve those problems. All right. Um, how are people feeling? You want to keep going? It's 11 o'clock. I think we can finish this one uh, by lunchtime uh, if we'd like. There's quite a bit. But uh, if, you, if you would like to take a break now, maybe we should take a 10-minute break. Take a break. Take a break. Got it. <laughs> See you at 11.10. Um, 
And uh, I, as I said, this is somewhat dry material, and I had a question about uh, visualizing these ranges. Some of the PNGs were, are missing. Uh, do you want to say anything about going to the individual machines, or are we just going to keep going with what we've got now? Um, we can go. I think we just keep going. Let's do it for period test. three, maybe. Yeah, yeah, and then for period three, we can test it out. Okay. It During lunch. Out. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So um, I, I'm sorry about some of the issues with the visualization. And um, I don't know whether you guys will, will already have PH525X. I think you do. So uh, if, if you want to um, visualize any of this stuff, you could start bringing in library PH525X. And then um, uh, I'm going to use PAR, which is part of base graphics. Now, we're going to talk a lot about visualization in the last section of the class. So that'll be at the end of the day. But inside PH525X, there's this plot ranges function that can be used to look at uh, all the different variations that we have talked about here. So um, PAR, MF row. Sorry, where are you? This is, I, I just wrote this now. So this is a new cell. Uh, where we are, you're going to add a new cell to your, to, your, to your notebook under exercises, let's say. Okay? So we're scrolling down. We got through 18.125. Metadata and indexing. Uh, you know, it's just a new cell. This is going to be self-standing. So you can, you can write this anywhere in the notebook. Oh, yeah. How do you add a new cell? Hit the plus button. See that plus button up there? That will open up a new cell, and um, you need to make sure that you're writing code. See, when you make a new cell, you can either be markdown or some other thing or code. And you want it to be code, and then you're going to open up that cell and put in this text. <clears throat> Library PH525X brings in the code for plot ranges. PAR, MF row equals C41, is something I haven't told you about. But it basically says take the plotting range and turn it into a matrix which has four rows and one column. Increase the font. I'm going to increase the font. Okay, here we go. All right. So this is good. This tests your, your plotting, your, your, your typing, and your ability to cut and paste. Um, the pattern is I'm going to do plot ranges of something. And the parameter xlim is going to be set for each one of these to the same interval, minus 3 to 40. And that's going to give me an x-axis that goes like that. And I want that to be the same for all of my plots. And I'm going to do plot of gaps of IR. A plot ranges of resize, IR1. A plot ranges of flank, IR3. And a plot ranges of IR. And at the bottom, that is the original set of ranges that we started with, IR. So that's why I put that at the bottom there. <laughs> OK, so when you're done, you will hit play, and then you will see this picture. If you don't have PH525X, is that the problem? Ah. Uh, you're in the, the general notebook. Does it work or does it fail? Yeah, you're, it's working. You're fine. Yeah. Yeah. The, the graphics may be slow to come on, but if you type this in, you will get this. <laughs> come on, cut and paste. Just cut and paste that four times and then change the inside.
I see you squinting back there. Do I need? Yeah, you're in, you're in good shape there. Yeah. And the three, you get rid of the three as well. Yeah. Pull the trigger. Yeah. Okay, what do we got here? Library 525X. PH. PH, right, right. Can't be. Good. Now scroll down. It's going to take a little while to render the graph, but I think you're in good shape. How's it going over here? Okay, you have an error. Right there, you need to get that one parenthesis and comma out of there. And uh, you get rid of the one. Yep. Yeah, now, now comma, and now I think you're ready to go. Yep. Everybody got it going? All right. The reason we're doing this is to just make sure that we're all on the same page with respect to the interpretation of these um, functions. And we'll come back to reduce in a minute. So IR was the original set of ranges. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ranges, each defined by a start and an end. And you can see them in the code that we gave originally. So if I change that a little bit and I put IR there and we run that, there you are. These are the original ranges and what we've done is visualize different operations. If we run flank, we're going to, and we run flank with argument three, we're going to get a three base pair, or three base, or three integer flanking interval here. For this one, for this one we get that, for this one we get that, and that, and so on. If we change the flank to some larger number, then those flanking intervals will be wider. Okay? The resize takes each one of these guys and shrinks it down to a single base at the start. There are other parameters that you can use to do other things with resizing. But this one just takes each one of them and makes the seven ranges that consist of a single base or a single integer of width. And then finally, the gaps says, look at this pile here and show me only the regions that are unoccupied. OK? Now I'm going to change the flank one to reduce, just so we can see what reduce looks like. Uh, we will run reduce on IR and run it again. So now instead of flanks, I have reduce. What is reduce doing? If you look at your original, ah, look at the original IR, reduce says I want to put together all the occupied regions in the smallest number of intervals that I can get. So that means I just take this because it's all occupied continuously and I get back one interval here. And these two guys have no complications at all. They just get preserved. So this is the reduce of this original collection. So one could say, well, if this is my pile up of reads, then this is maybe my transcript, right? If you're doing some de novo discovery. That's the usefulness of reduce, one of the uses of reduce. OK, any questions about this? If we add reduce to that window, it'll just add another plot to the image? Again. You may get into a little trouble, because if you add it here, you better increase that so that you have five rows. OK? You coordinate the layout of the, of the terminal, which we don't like to talk about, with what you're asking it to do. All right, a little improvisation to 
sweeten the exposure to eye ranges. Okay? Now, we haven't talked about overlaps. So now I'm going to take two groups of intervals. I'm going to let IR1 be the ranges that are the third and seventh, and IR2 be all the ranges excluding the third and the seventh. Okay, that should be familiar to you from R. If I want to keep just a few things, I put an integer index vector in my vector. If I want to get rid of them, I turn it to a negative. So now IR1 is this pair of, of ranges, and IR2 are these five ranges. All the metadata comes along. And now I'm going to use find overlaps. Okay, that's a pretty natural thing to want to do. Take IR1 and IR2 and look for overlaps. Now if we come back to our little graph here, it's not going to be so easy to do because I haven't defined IR1 and IR2. But I can take that code and use it here. <coughs> Right, this is actually a, a, not a bad exercise. Let's say we just want to plot IR1 and IR2. I use plus here. I already have my I range, my PH525X, so I can do uh, par MF row equals C21 to have a two row plotting surface. Plot ranges IR1. Uh, X lim equals C minus 3, 40. And plot ranges IR2, X lim equal C minus 3, 40. Okay, let's hope for the best. No good. I don't have IR1 or IR2. So I guess these were never run. Let's run them and then run our plotter. There they are. Now IR2 is kind of large. Let's reduce our, our size of our, oops. Something strange happens when you, um, there. We want to look at IR1 and IR2 in context. Can you slide down the code again? The code. The code is, yeah. I'm setting up a two-row plotting surface, and I'm just asking for the ranges from IR1 and the ranges from IR2. Total of seven ranges, and all I'm going to do is try and understand how find overlaps works. So what do you think? If I want to find the overlaps between IR1 and IR2, uh, what should the answer be like? It's kind of a, a good applied problem, right? Suppose these are your reads, and this is your gene model, right? I want to know which reads are hitting my genes. Well, these are my promoters, something like that, right? <clears throat> so what is that going to look like? <clears throat> well, for each one of the reads, I want to say, yes, it's in IR1, or no, it is not. <clears throat> and likewise for IR2. It's a pretty complicated process. You're going to say, well, what's the overlapping relationship here? So here it is. Let's say I do find overlaps. I'll blow up my fonts now. If I do find overlaps of IR1 to IR2, let's run this here, what I get back is what's called a hits object. And it has three hits. Why does it have three hits? Well, if I think about the query, IR1, it is going to overlap this one, this one, and this one. I don't think it overlaps this one. Maybe it does. Maybe it fails to overlap this one. Mm -hmm. This one. This one fails to overlap. OK. So these three guys are somehow overlapping that, and this one doesn't get anything. <clears throat> so the subject of my query was IR1. IR1, this guy, hit three of these intervals. And this one didn't hit any of them. 
And the hits object has two components, the query hits and the subject hits. And it's telling me that of the query, IR1, only the first interval had any hits. And for IR2, the first, third, and fourth had hits. And that is in terms of the original ordering of the ranges in IR1 and IR2. Okay, so let's just spell this out a little bit more. Uh, IR1, IR2, <coughs> IR1 query hits of FO, and IR2 subject hits of FO. We can run all that code. We run the find overlaps and we look at it. We go back. Here's IR1 and IR2. IR1 had two ranges and IR2 had five ranges. And if I ask which of IR1 had overlaps, it's always Mr. C. And if I ask which of the IR2 were overlapped, then I find it's these three ranges. Okay, because 14 and 19 overlap at 14. 14 and 19 overlap with 15 and 29. And 14 to 19 overlaps with 19 to 24. <clears throat> Yep. We're just breaking everything up so that you can see what's going on. The find overlaps generates this hits object. The hits object can be operated on by a query hits function or a subject hits function, and that tells us which of these guys actually had overlaps with the query that we posed. Okay. So that's all abstract, working with interval ranges that we don't have any real interpretation of. Let's go into the world of genes, and then maybe you will see more motivation from a genomics perspective. And that is what G ranges are for. Are there any questions about this overlap? It's a little complicated, but if you give yourself some time, I think you'll understand that this operation has some intrinsic complexity to it. You're asking which part of this overlaps with this part of that, and you have to coordinate that information, and the hits object takes care of that for you. <clears throat> One other operation is uh, here. I can use percent sign over percent sign as a binary operator, which will tell me for each of the ranges in IR1 whether it overlaps with IR2 or not. Now, how about in the other direction? Anyone want to tell me what's coming out there? What's the length of this second one? <clears throat> Remember what IR2 looks like. This is it. If I'm asking whether this IR2 overlaps IR1, how many results am I going to get? One person has flashed a signal. Four? Five. The answer is five, right? I'm asking for each one of these ranges. Does it overlap any of the ranges in IR1? Yes or no? That's all. There will be five answers. So let's run it. It's this one here. True, false, true, true, false. So that's telling me that the first one, the third, and the fourth overlap with IR1. And that's exactly what we saw with this query hits, subject hits. The subject hits of our find overlaps is that 1, 3, and 4 have overlaps. This will become second nature to you once you start working with genes and exons and so on. Okay? <clears throat> Questions, comments? All right, how are we doing? 11.31. Lunch will be served at noon, I assume? Yeah, somewhere around noon. Somewhere around. OK. Always approximating. Yeah. Um, well, I think we can, we can make some, some good headway here. We might not finish by noon, but we're going to keep going, OK? So let's start again. G ranges 
is telling us a lot more than just ranges tell us. Let's look at what it does. Well, there's a seek names. The seek names is coming at the issue that we're generally going to work with multi-chromosome organism contexts. Okay? And so humans have 22 chromosomes plus some sex chromosomes. And you want to know which chromosome a given gene lives on. So we're going to always have this seek name structure. Uh, it's very general. It's not a chromosome. It's a seek name. It's saying that this organism is going to have a genome that lies in a collection of sequences. And we're going to make a mapping from some entities to those sequences using the seek names. And you'll see this little guy here, RLE. That stands for run length encoding. And that's a very efficient way of dealing with potentially repetitious information. So for example, a lot of the data are going to consist of CHR9 repeated many times. And so we just use a run length encoding to uh, count the number of repetitions and the value. That's somewhat technical, but those of you who like um, computer science details would, would uh, like to know that. The same is the case with the strand. So we have a sequence. We understand that many of our organisms will have multiple strands. And then the genes are actually going to occupy certain intervals. We use I ranges to deal with those. And then we can have any kind of metadata we want. Each range gets some vector of metadata elements. Question? Can you use the run length encoding to find the number of repeats of chromosome 8? Well, yes, you can do all kinds of things with the run length encoding. But I'm not sure that your question is complicated. Let's just take a quick look at it. Um, so uh, I'm going to make sure I ran this. And there we go. Uh, library Homo sapiens takes a little while to load. And um, there, there, we have that now. OK. So let's look at the seek names of HG, all right? And in fact, I will comment out HG now, so this is all we see. There. So it's getting complicated. This is a factor RLE of a certain length with a certain number of runs. And the runs are the important part, OK? And they're not that much smaller in this ordering than they could be. But you can work with this. You can do something with the seek names. Let's say save it to rs equals that. And then you can start operating on it, for example, to see that um, run, run values of rs 1 to 20. That's a new vector. I think that works. No, run value, I think it is. Yes, run value like that and run length. So I, I hope that answers your question. Um, you know. <laughs> OK, good. So we have these wonderful things, HG, the human genomes. Obligatory metadata structure called uh, seek names that gives the chromosome occupied. The strand features have a biological direction. Uh, and that is for you. And um, in terms of I ranges, the plus strand go from start to end, and the minus strand go from end to start. Um, we're not going to get too deeply into this issue of strand, uh, but uh, the information is there, and it's well documented. Now, here is uh, an ordering of the genes uh, so that it makes a little more sense. Uh, the first chromosome comes first, second chromosome is second, and so on. Now the RLE is a much more uh, efficient representation of the data. But you might ask the question, well, why don't we also put the genes in order in terms of the chromosome position? And that's an, an exercise. Add code that orders the ranges by starting position within chromosome. And there are two ways of accomplishing that. Uh, one is strand invariant. So you just take the start position and you use that as, as a second argument to order. Order can take multiple arguments, and it just orders hierarchically. Uh, or you can use sort. 
So it's interesting to know that these have different results. So if I add this next, uh, next one here, if I do sort of Hg, it's not the same. When I use this approach to just order by start, I get the strands mixed up. If I use sort, it puts the positive strand before the negative strand. Going too fast? Well, this is the code. This is the code of all. Yeah. And these are entree gene IDs. So NCBI has annotated a given gene to this interval on the chromosome, told us at what strand it's on, and all the genes, all 23,056, are available uh, to you in this way. <clears throat> Question? Yeah? What? Oh, I just wanted to add because I can't help myself for the team. Besides the, the stuff behind RLE. What else, what, what else I think is so cool about it is you, know, you, you took these R courses before you started here and learned about basic vectors and stuff like that. Um, and now there are all these exotic new things like RLE and I ranges, but most of the stuff you learned there still works, which is, I think, just amazing. So you can, if you want to know about the, fan, the fancy stuff about an RLE, that's fine. But if you don't, you just treat it like a vector, like you learned, and that stuff still works, like sort and order and, you know, square bracket subsetting just all still works. Yeah, here's a nice one. Um, so uh, I'll just add one more cell. And, um, you know, if you want to know how many genes there are on different chromosomes, table, seek names of each gene should work, and it does. And so if you wanted to tell your friends, well, you know, there's different numbers of chromosomes on genes, you can start seeing that. Now, that doesn't look so good. What's, one of the issues here is that I have 96 some odd chromosomes. It's not really what we intended. Uh, so you would have to say something like keep standard chromosomes here. So you, you just go and make the onion a little bit uh, thicker. Uh, keep standard chromosomes. I think we have to say something like uh, prune. Equals course. I don't know whether that'll work. Yeah. I don't know, uh, but there are ways to to prune it down to the um, to the uh, twenty three canonical chromosomes, and we'll get to it later. I, I just don't remember the exact syntax. So as as Levi was just saying, these G ranges can be treated as any standard vector. You can just pull out four elements where you can sort them. And uh, you can set the strand to star if you don't care about strand. And then uh, the strand will be ignored. The seek info, as I mentioned to you before, is a, a, a separate data structure that tells you the lengths of the chromosomes. Because you might do operations on these ranges that actually take you beyond the end. And you'd like to know that. And you, you are sort of automatically warned if you're using standard operations to do that, that you've tripped over the edge of a chromosome. Um, and then how many circular chromosomes are there? Well, just the mitochondrial one. And um, we did the table there. So if I want to limit myself to just chromosome 22, this is the type of annotation I can use. Seek names, check it against chromosome 22. And I use which a lot, which just gives me the integer indices and this just gives me back the genes on chromosome 22. There are 535 of them. And here is that keep standard chromosomes uh, function with pruning.mode equal course. It gets rid of all the random unassigned un un uh, sequences. They keep standard chromosomes. OK. So now, there is also more structure which is the genes are not just contiguous intervals on the genome, but they are 
composed of UTRs and exons and introns. And in this case, what I'm going to do, instead of using genes, I'm going to use a function called exons by on homo Dutch sapiens with by equal gene. And that is going to enumerate the genes. And for each gene, it's going to have a separate G ranges that tells me the positions of the exons. OK? Now, gene models uh, may be uh, complicated. And we have our plot ranges. So why don't we see whether we can actually plot one of these gene models here for, for EBG1, let's say. So EBG1 is EBG is this exons by. Now, that, that function is a little slow. Exons by is digging into homo dot sapiens and pulling out uh, many, many uh, exons. And here is just the first one, the first gene. Now what I'm going to do is get the ranges out of there. And I think if you say ranges of EBG1, you would just get the ranges. Now I should have just saved that. Yeah, very nice. So we'll do that. And then we'll use our plot, plot ranges. There. So now you're seeing all the exons. And the, the way plot ranges works is if some of the ranges that you're asking it to plot uh, collide with one another, it'll make another column. So this isn't the gene model in the sense that the transcripts are connected to one another. This is just showing you all the exons and how they are sorted in this particular gene body. We'll go into visualization at the end, which actually will look at transcript. Can we scroll up a little bit? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, we took EBG1 and we just ran our plot ranges function on it. So this is just to orient you with what's going on when we get these uh, exon collections from G ranges. Okay, so here's our exercise. <coughs> Note that unlist EBG is efficiently computed and retains the gene entree ID as the name of each exon range. Give the entree ID of the gene with the longest exon. And unfortunately, the answer is there, but I'll get rid of it. <laughs> so what do we need to do to solve this exercise? Yes? Here, uh, I'll use this. Oh, yeah, you use it. I think we have to run the function and then sort and just choose the first in the sorted list? Uh, well, w which function are you talking about? <clears throat> that, yeah. OK, so let's see what we got here. I think we already have EBG, right? So now you're saying we can do something with this to find the longest exon. What are we going to do? Sort it? Um, to find the largest, largest range, um, I'm not sure. It's okay. All right. So I gave you a little hint here. We need to unlist, right? So the, the, the exons by gene is a list of G ranges. So let's take UEBG equals unlist of EBG. Now I think we're getting closer to what you're proposing in that UEBG, we can print this out as well. Notice that we have this nice way of abbreviating the screen dumps. You know, if you listed out these 27,000 or 270,000 exons, that would be a pain in the neck. The screen would just keep on scrolling on. But we've put these nice, um, there are options that can say, how many do I want at the top and at the bottom? But that's, that's a very nice little feature there. So you've got UEBG, and you're trying to find the, um, <coughs> Entree ID of the longest exon. You have a clearer idea how to do that now? It's R. UEB, UEBG. One of the nice things you can do is say uh, which.max width of UEBG. I'm just using R here.
Okay, so let's think about what happened. UEBG is just a G ranges. Therefore, width has a very trivial implementation for it. Which.max goes and finds the index of the largest value of its argument. And then I just use brackets to get back that particular range. Well, fortunately, it keeps the metadata. So I know now that I've got this G. This is the entree ID of this exon, which has the largest width of any exon. Now here's another problem. What's the distribution of exon widths in the human genome? Yeah? 1.5%. What? Human calculator. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a great one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, interesting. So um, I, I was asking for the distribution in the following sense. Um, hist with UEBG. I'm taking a histogram. Okay? It's a horrible histogram because there's one really large exon. So we do something a little more informative by taking a transformation. Let's say I take the log. Let's do log 10. Now, I think your point is different. You're saying how much of the genome is made up of exons. Okay, so now here I go. I've got some information now on the distribution of exon width, and I can see that the mode is about 100 bases. And if you look at the mode, you start to see some, some regularities. You start to see, well, there's a lot of exons that are length 96, and a lot that are length 108. It might be interesting to understand why that is. But that's something you can explore. Now, your point was, well, let's figure out how much of the genome is actually taken up by exons. And, you know, one way to do that, I guess, would be to say, well, I'm going to take the reduce of UEBG and take the sum of the width. So then I'm, I'm putting together all the ones that are lying on top of each other. And let's see if we can get that. No good. Syntax error. Fix the syntax. There you go. 83 million. So you take 83 million and you divide it by 3 times 10 to the ninth, right? 2.8%. You're close. <laughs> I don't know whether that's the right answer or not, but that's our calculation here, okay? All right, so strand-aware operations. Uh, remember now, we've got um, GIR here. I'll split this so you can see what I'm doing here. And let's not do any plotting quite yet. Well, we'll just go with it. So what is GIR? Remember our old friends IR? Ten more minutes, guys. Our old friends IR were seven intervals. And what we've done is we've embedded them in a G ranges object. And we put a chromosome on them. And we told that the first four are on strand plus, And the last three are on strand minus. And so now we've taken this abstract set of intervals and put them on a chromosome. And now we can use plot G ranges with all the operations that we learned about with respect to I ranges. So for example, the flanks of GIR with start equal false, these are all going to be ending flank intervals. And you have made some changes to this so that you can see better which strand we're on? Yeah, there's, I can give a link to just to it or something, but just another possibility of using this one that colors the different strands differently. Uh-huh, yeah. Yes, that, that would be nice. So within here, some of these are on the plus strand, and some of them are on the minus strand, and it's going to make a difference. Let's just try to understand the resize before we go on. So these are the original ranges on chromosome 1. And I'm going to run the resize command to get 
what this would be is, let's say if these were genes, resize GIR1 would be give me the transcription start site of each gene. Give me the first base of the gene body. And you can question that, but that's the basic uh, idea. So here we are. This interval mapped to this. This one mapped to this. These are both on the plus strand, so that is fine. This one is on the minus strand. And its resize to 1 is to the right. OK? Likewise for this one. So that idea of taking the strand context and reinterpreting these operations so that they make sense given the strand is taken care of for you. OK. Now, I want to do some real human biology if you feel comfortable where we've gotten to now. We're going to work with the GWAS catalog, genome-wide association studies. Okay? Every month or so, used to be at NCBI. Uh, they would go through the literature, find all the um, genome-wide association studies, take the SNPs, and see whether these SNPs have been replicated. And if they were, they'd put them in a catalog. What kind of SNPs? Well, there's SNPs that have been shown in some sort of cohort or population study to be associated with some phenotype of interest. So here we go. We have a library called GWAS-CAT. And there's a data structure in there called EBI-CAT 37. And it's a type of G-ranges. It's a slightly extended G-ranges because there's so much metadata recorded on each one of these studies that if you just treat it as a plain G-ranges, you'd never be able to, to show it nicely. So I wrote a, a little method that just wraps this um, information and only gives you three of the pieces of metadata. What is the disease? What is the name of the SNP? And what was the p-value of the association? There's a lot more information in there which we can get at. But right now, these are what are presented in the show method. So for here, we have 22,000 records recording phenotype SNP association. This is a fundamental tool of genetic epidemiology. I've got links here. For example, this link takes us out to the um, catalog. And just so you get a little clearer on this, there's this nice diagram. You don't have to do this. But this is presenting it in another way. Each one of these is a chromosome. And what they're showing you is how many different associations have been found for different phenotypes by analyzing the genome and genetic epidemiology. Very impressive. So you're going to work with that data here. You have it as a G ranges. And so we run this piece. We run the library, GWAS-CAT. And then we assign, because it has no, it has a certain genome tag here, GRCH37. That's how the EBI guys refer to this, and the Genome Research Consortium comes up with their own build names. But for us to work with what we've got, we need to use the label HG19. They're the same genome build, a slight difference in the way they deal with the mitochondrion, but let's not worry about that. Um, so we're just going to relabel it to HG19. And now we're going to do something which is actually pretty amazing. We're going to ask for the overlaps between the gene bodies that we've got in HG and the genome-wide associations catalog. We run find overlaps. There are 20,000 some odd genes and uh, 22,000 associations in this version of the catalog. And we get back a hits object. So what is this telling us? The query was the set of genes. The subject is the set of genome-wide association studies and their SNPs. And this is telling us that the second gene in our gene catalog overlaps the 140th SNP in the catalog of GWAS. All right. So that can be used to figure out which gene overlaps which SNP. 
and you can ask very general questions. For example, how many unique genes actually have associations of this type? Whoops, I didn't run that yet. So we're running this here, this here. There's our find overlaps. And now we're going to get the length of the unique query hits. So even though there are 12,000 events of overlap, you can see that there are some genes that overlap multiple hits. So we want to just reduce down to the number of unique genes, and that turns out to be 4,700. And then if we want to ask, what is the frequency with which SNPs lie in the gene bodies as given by our catalog? 51% <coughs> uh, of the SNPs in this catalog uh, over, lie over genes. Now the genes are made up of introns and extrons. In, in, introns and exons, and so if I ask for the frequency over exons, and this is sort of a, um, a nuisance uh, because most of these um, <clears throat> are not in coding regions. Only 7% of our SNPs lie in coding uh, DNA. So there's a, there's a mystery. They must have regulatory effects. They don't just change the proteins that are being produced. And that's one of the reasons that genetic epidemiologists are in such heavy business. And then here we are. Uh, we can use promoters, for example. This is a simple definition of promoters. It just says go upstream from each of the genes, 20,000 bases, and then ask whether your uh, uh, SNPs overlie these promoters. And that tends out to be uh, much more frequent than uh, overlapping coding DNA. Okay. Any questions about that? <coughs> These are pretty powerful questions that have been posed with just a couple of lines of code. Yes? Simple question. This works wonderfully for the human genome, but how about fly or, fly or sea urchin or some other? Because this is all based on the... If you did arc. a GWAS on sea urchin, <laughs> did you? There's a lot of GWAS on fly data. Yeah, great. Uh, I don't know where the GWAS catalog is for flies, but if there is one, we turn it into a G ranges, okay? We do have a DM, D melanogaster, G. We have these things, and you would just plug in the catalog for your fly and the gene catalog for your fly, and you do the same things. Cool. All right. Yes. Is there a way to create a catalog for an organism because you can make PXDB, for instance, is a yes. function that makes transcripts DB, right? So is there? Is there something similar that will help you create catalogs for any of these sort of generic resources? Yes, as a matter of fact, there is. And um, you can use Biomart or you can use Ensemble. They give you GFF files or other very standard representations of these. We have functions that will convert them into these types of structures, yes. I didn't get into that here, but uh, maybe for the second course, if there's a big interest in that, that can be covered. Okay, lunch is here, and um, I think we can stop. This is a pretty good point. Any questions before we break for lunch? We can start in an hour's time, I think. Okay, thank you. Please feel free to ask any questions during yeah. lunch or in the all right. Um, I hope everyone's well fortified after their lunch. Um, <clears throat> so one, I need to make a couple of one quick announcement. Um, please, you know, you can save your notebook by going to File and hitting, you know, clicking Download As, and if you save it as HTML, it'll be a fully encapsulated HTML file. So. You know, do that for every period as you're going through so that you can take it home with you. Um, but not to worry, you know, we will also have these, um, these notebooks available um, afterwards as well online in case. And in a few days, we'll also have the videos and things so that you can come back to the material, um, you know, if, if needed. So um, with that, I'll let Vince take okay. over again. Thank you, Ashok, and thank you for coming back. I, um, I think we are 
let, let's just review where we've come thus far. We started out talking about R and bioconductor, the purpose of it, and um, we moved into data management, <clears throat> and we created this thing called the uh, expression set out of a couple of tables. <clears throat> and um, I think that all went well. We brought in some data from uh, GEO, and we saw that the expression set was used to represent 12 samples. And then we saw that those samples had a structure. <clears throat> there were six controls and six treated, and within each of those groups there were three normal cells and three <clears throat> glioblastoma cells. <clears throat> so what you're seeing is that <clears throat> genomic data uh, can be thought of in terms of these tables, feature names, sample identification, and so on, in a coordinated way. And then we changed gears, and we went into these eye ranges. And as I said, I feel that's somewhat dry, but it's, it's actually essential to this new generation of assays. You see, when we were working with the microarrays, there was a fixed number of features that was spotted on the array or synthesized oligos, and that was it. You had everything that was on the array and nothing else. In the domain of next generation sequencing, however you want to think of it, that fixed feature set no longer exists. Instead, you have freedom to interpret the reads that you get out of your sequencer any way you like. You can align them, you can look for overlaps of certain genomic regions that no one else ever thought of. And so to have the <clears throat> flexibility to deal with assays that do not have this fixed feature set in advance, we had to change gears. We had to, we had to have a new paradigm of how to represent our data. We want to keep this idea that there's an object that coordinates all the sample information and the um, assay information. <clears throat> we want to keep that idea. We want to think of that as an R array, so that there's X, and then there's a bracket, and some feature selection, and some sample selection, and close the bracket, and that makes sense. <clears throat> but we don't have the convenience or simplicity of this fixed feature set. We need to know how you want to organize the genome to represent your features as you count up the reads over the genome. So that's why I spend so much time on uh, genomic ranges. <clears throat> now I want to move to something which I think is much more uh, down to earth for many of you. <clears throat> How to use these genomic ranges to work with the outputs of experimental systems or assay, assay technologies or what have you. And we'll start out with um, <clears throat> a collection of bed files. How many people have worked with bed files? A good number of you? Okay. So the definition of a bed file is it's, um, you know, a textual file, typically tab delimited, and it has information about uh, an interval on the genome. And there's a very specific way of ordering the fields in the bed file so that this standard is met, and tools that know how to produce bed files can operate effectively without any special interventions. <coughs> Now what I wanted to do in order to think about um, <clears throat> genomic ranges and bed files was to have examples that are relevant to the epigenomics roadmap. And just in case you haven't uh, gotten acquainted with that, <clears throat> a lot of this information comes out of the ENCODE project. And uh, the basic idea, I've probably done it too much here, is that there's a lot of tissue-specific assays that have been done. Many of them are ChIP-seq. And uh, yeah, we can initialize this grid visualization here to get some sense of uh, what's going on there. Yeah, there we are. <clears throat> so this is the sort of thing we want to have some familiarity with. Uh, these are histone modifications that ChIP-seq experiments are, are able to identify uh, in uh, genomic DNA. <clears throat> and um, they all have certain biological implications for the regions in which they are identified. That's one of our dimensions here. And then another dimension is a tissue uh, in, in which we're going to derive uh, um, DNA 
and all its epigenetic modifications and try to figure out what those modifications are tissue by tissue. Okay? So this is sort of bread and butter bioinformatics. You have to be able to work with something like this in order to understand how to solve questions about gene regulation and ultimately understand how these tissues are differentiated from one another, how diseased tissues are differentiated from healthy tissues, and so on. Okay? That's why the IRMA package was created to help people understand how bioconductor can work with data of this nature. <clears throat> now, we can run this little block here. To load the IRMA package and make something called an IRMA set. And <clears throat> An IRMA set object, here it is, has 31 files. So it manages information about 31 files that are sitting on your computer, in my computer, or on the computer where you've got your R session running. And they are all bed files, gzip bed files. In fact, uh, I'm pretty sure they're Tabix indexed so that we can make quick extractions given addresses that we're interested in. <clears throat> so if you have a bunch of bed files, you can wrap them up in something called a genomic files object and this IRMA set is just a slight variation on genomic files, again, dealing with the fact that we want to be able to manage the data. And uh, this is a very nice uh, little technology here. The DT package will take a data frame and generate the searchable HTML table for you where you can get all the information about the different bed files that have been organized by this epigenomics roadmap. So there's plenty of metadata there, all organized and bound into this ER set. Okay? So if you have a bunch of bed files and you have a table that describes each one of them, this table can be put into this genomic files object as the call data. Okay, so we're thinking of features as rows, columns as samples, and call data is the information about the samples. This is a new model. It's not expression sets. It's a bit more general. Does the, does the ER set always populate on the local disk? No. Uh, I had to. This is a special little function here. Let's take a look at it. <clears throat> uh, make Irma set. OK, so we will run this cell here. Here's the function. OK? So it turns out that there's a collection of bed files sitting in a folder. And it's actually with the installation of the IRMA package. This set of bed files is sitting in there. And we can get the paths to them. And we, have, we supply those paths to this genomic files function. And then we take care of some issues with the call data. And then we hand back this IRMA set. So if you had your own bed files, you'd be up somewhere around here saying, I'm going to set this genomic files down. That's going to give me one object that refers to all these files. I'm going to set up the call data, which tells me about each one of them. And then I have a genomic files object that's organized. Okay? <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> now, the way that our um, epigenomics roadmap worked with the data is um, uh, somewhat involved. But what they did is they tell you something about the origins of the DNA that was analyzed. They come from different cell lines, many different types of T cells. I only took a small number of the hundreds of epigenomes that have been analyzed now, and I was focusing on immune cell subsets. So that's what this data set is, is focused on. <clears throat> and there's a field in there called anatomy. And uh, you can use R then to get the anatomy variable out of this ER set and tabulate it and see that most of the data is coming from the blood. There are seven samples from brain and so on. And there are more details about the actual um, tissues that were sampled. And you can get that by looking in that table. All right. <clears throat> now, this is where things get really interesting. I have this ER set. It's made for you by the IRMA package. I can use the R track layer package to import a piece of one of those files. Which piece? Well, I'm going to use the G ranges to say I want 
all the positions between 1 million and 1.1 million on chromosome 1. What do we know about this particular epigenome in terms of what's going on in this part of the genome? Well, according to the assay that was used and its interpretation through something called Chrome HMM, which was developed at the Broad Institute, this part of the genome for that type of tissue is a bivalent promoter component. This part is repressed polycomb. You have to know these abbreviations. I think I have a link to it somewhere here where you can learn more about how did these guys figure out to call this part of the genome bivalent promoter, this one poise promoter, this one a transcription start site, and so on. <clears throat> what we've done is we've taken genomic sequence and labeled it according to its likely regulatory function. Okay, and there are ways of analyzing sequence or analyzing uh, patterns of methylation um, and histone modification and so on that lead to these classifications. They're statistical in nature. Okay? You might want to actually get some of this tissue and see whether this is the right, you, you have some wet lab assay to see whether this is actually the right way of thinking about this piece of the genome. But here we're just using the statistical inferences of Manolis Kellis's lab to come up with these um, ways of characterizing DNA from this particular cell type. <clears throat> okay, so here we go. That's a look at a particular piece of the genome for a particular cell type, and the next one is looking at the next cell type, and there it is. And you can see that in this interval, there is a slight change uh, when we get to Oh, I don't know. Yes, we look at the end towards the 1.1 million. The first cell type is said to be an enhancer, but the other one is a promoter. So there are different uh, epigenetic patterns observed in these two cell types at that interval of the genome. Okay? Notice that there are 68 intervals for the first cell type, 72 for the second. There's no guarantee that the intervals are common across the different cell types. That's the nature of the bed files. The bed files just tell you a bunch of intervals. There's no restriction to a common set of intervals over a set of bed files. <clears throat> now here is a way of looking at changes in state for the promoter region of a given gene for uh, a number of different cell types. So it's called state profile. It's a function. And remember, I'm using this annotation. I'm thinking of my ER set as a matrix. This says I'm looking at all of the, uh, I'm not going to restrict it with respect to the features. I'm going to restrict it with respect to the samples. And the samples that were actually retained are different tissues. And we'll go down to the bottom here. So what we're seeing is that our, the region that we looked for is just a little bit upstream of IL-33R, I think it was. And so that corresponds to a certain set of genomic locations. And if we have tissue from the adult lung, we see that there is enhancer activity in the promoter region, let's say here. But in the fetal lung, there is more of a poised promoter, or perhaps an enhancer here. Okay? So this is helping you to summarize possible differences in epigenetic state around a given gene, the gene we selected here, among these different tissue types. <clears throat> IL-33 is the gene. Okay? So what we're saying is that by managing our bed files in this way and writing some functions that extract information about the different epigenetic states that we can have, we can make a display of this type to show people that there may be interesting regulatory differences for this gene that differentiate cells from different organs. <clears throat> so, to summarize, bed files are representations of outputs of genome scale experiments. You can have a bed file that's just telling you where the peaks are, let's say, in a ChIP-seq experiment, or you can have a bed file that's telling you a refined interpretation of a bunch of ChIP-seq experiments where what's been recorded on each one of the intervals is just some aspect of chromatin state 
or an inference about regulatory state. Collections of bed files can be managed with genomic files objects. We have something called call data, which tells us about the samples. We can restrict information, restrict attention using row ranges. And we can use import in the R track layer package to get the information that we're interested in into our R session. And state profile is one way of visualizing these things. Yes? So I have a question about um, sort of doing most of the analysis using like this kind of objects. Like for example, this is an Irma type object. But let's say that I only want to do half of the analysis in this particular pipeline, but then I want to take the data out and do a ggplot figure or something like that. How can you basically subset any of this data and turn it into a regular matrix for ggplot, for instance? Yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> so um, as, as you say, ggplot knows how to deal with data frames. You take data frames, you make some bindings for the aesthetics, you get some geoms, you get some stats. We'll talk about that at the end of the day. Do you want to export data from here for the sake of a customized um, visualization? You can do that. Um, let's see what's going on in state profile, which may help you see where that information is coming out. Okay? Because state profile um, may well be a GG plot. I think it is, yeah. So let's quickly look at this function. It's actually running the state profile. There it is. So you're getting into some advanced stuff here. But let's see if we can read it. Okay? So the gene model for the symbol that we're asking for is just going to give me a G ranges for that interval. Not very interesting. Then we resize it to find the transcription start site. So that's something you already learned about. Then we have a promoters method here, which just goes and finds the upstream region that we're interested in. OK, no big deal. Then over here, we're going to run this thing called liberal import. And the liberal import is going to each one of the bed files and getting the numeric data you might be interested in or the character data for all of the intervals. So it's this import step that's going over each one of the elements of this object that's actually extracting character or numeric data. And then, <laughs> now why we use liberal import is, is a long story. It has to do with the fact that there's no coordination between the bed files on which intervals are actually going to be pulled. Now, here we are building up. There you go. ggplot. You see? So everything that's going on here is taking that data, which is all uncoordinated, smoothing it out so that it can fit in a data frame, and then running ggplot with geomrect in order to get the, the different colors in place and so on. So it's all in the source there to do that. And it's a question, it's up to you. If you don't like this particular way of doing it, maybe you can pull this code and make some changes and then get a different data frame that you do something else with. Okay? All right. I had no idea I could answer that. <clears throat> but it's, you know, you've got the R there, so you can often get somewhere. Okay? So, uh, any other questions? That was a good one. All right, let's go into uh, one exercise here. There are 15 samples with anatomy label blood. List their cell types using the standardized epigenomic.name component of call data. Well, I think the answer is here. <clears throat> Let's just go over it. I can subset my ER set using the column index to just take those which have anatomy equal to blood. And then once I've got that, I run the call data function to get out the call data and just pick out the standardized epigenome.name. And then I get this list, which is somewhat unpleasant to read. So if we change it a little bit, Given our wonderful uh, IPython notebook or Jupyter notebook, if you just change it a little bit, you can do that. And now you get a beautiful table. I think I did it twice. OK? That's the exercise. Can you go in and find the variables and tabulate them the way we ask? Yes? <laughs>
you know, it's ugly. Dollar signs, double equals, dollar sign, and so on. But once you get that sense that I can go and get some metadata by using dollar sign here, subset the big data by doing that, and then get another piece of metadata out using dollar sign again, you can do such, such things very naturally. Maybe they're a little too natural for me. I need to forget. All right. <clears throat> now we're going to go to something which is more for the RNA-seq people. <laughs> you didn't get your dollar signs. All right. The next topic is going to be for RNA-seq mavens. Any of you who are familiar with the tidyverse or Hadley Wickham stuff in R will know that this is anathema to people, where you have to constantly refer to the object as you make subsets. And that's why we have this wonderful deplier chaining of arguments and so on. It's not well developed for bioconductor tools yet, so you wind up having this. But it all makes perfect sense, and once you get used to it, it's, it's fine. Okay, to move on? All right. BAM files. So there's a very nice um, package called RNA-seq data. By the way, I always put the links into the packages, or I try to anyway. So if you click on the link, I open the link in the new window, you go to the man page, not the man page, but the package download page for the package that has been referenced. And this is telling you all about the... Um, package here and it includes links to the place where you actually get the data and so on. So it's nice to have these Jupyter notebooks with all their hyperlinks. In this case we're going to run uh, a little bit of code that works with this RNA-seq data package and what has happened is uh, the, I think there are eight files, right, eight files from this uh, study where only the reads from chromosome, that map to chromosome 14 have been retained. So we make a genomic files object, and um, this is just a constant. This is just a list of eight file paths, and um, you get them. So now you have a new object called GF, and there are some hints here. Here are the files we've got. There are eight of them, and we can use things like files or row ranges or call data to work with this to make extracts to learn about what's going on. <clears throat> Now, the features that we're interested in are defined by G-ranges. It turns out that this is a G-ranges corresponding to this gene, HNRNPC, which was knocked down in this experiment. So what I'm going to do is take this region of interest, a G-ranges, and bind it into the GF object as its row ranges. And now it's no longer a genomic files object with zero ranges. It now has one range. Okay, it's still just an object. There's not a lot of data in R. It's just sitting on disk. And I'm going to do a little bit more. I'm going to make a call data for it, which distinguishes the wild type samples from the knockout samples. That's just a data frame with this vector as the variable TRT. And now we're going to run... <coughs> Sure, I ran this here. Run this here. Keep going. Okay. Now we're going to run something that's a little involved. I'll just start it now. We're going to use a function called summarize overlaps that will work through the files by looking in its row ranges and determining which of the paired end reads fall into the range that we have asked for, which is specifically the region for HNRNPC. Okay? I put a suppressed warnings around it because um, there are some uh, unaligned reads, I think, that um, it wants to complain about. We just leave that off for now. And there it is. It's done. <clears throat> So what happened? We ran this function summarize overlaps 
we have one region of the, in, of the genome that we want to look at. And it created this thing called a range summarized experiment. This is the new version of expression set for sequencing data. And it has a schema. I think I show it here. There. Okay, so remember the old the freehand that I showed you for the uh, uh, expression set? This is a nicer picture that was actually published in Nature Methods that shows how we organize data on sequencing. We need to know information about all the different genes that we're going to be studying or any type of feature. And in particular, we're probably going to have ranges that tell us where on the genome they live. And those are the ranges we're going to use for our read counting. Then we have the actual data. These are the matrices, usually one matrix for the counts, let's say, but we might want to have uh, another matrix of the same dimensions for FPKM or what have you. And then, as usual, there's information about each one of the samples stored in another table. And then there's information about the experiment as a whole. And these all get wrapped together in one entity, which we call an instance of the summarized experiment class. And what has happened for us here is that we've gone from a bunch of BAM files to a summarized experiment. Now, it's a very special type of summarized experiment because it only has one feature that was studied. But if you had a bunch of ranges in this row ranges, then there would be one feature measured for each one of the ranges there. And there's now a method. It's not experts anymore to get the expression data out, but it's just something called assay which actually pulls the data out. So let us run this little assay command here. Make sure that runs. And then we see this table. And the nice thing about the table is that these were the wild type samples. And they actually have a reasonable number of reads falling in to the HNRNPC interval. And the knockout have relatively low numbers. And when Levi speaks, he will tell you how to do this the right way and do correct statistical inference on differential expression in RNA-seq studies. I'm just showing you how we manage the data. Okay? All right. So we are finishing up um, interval two. This is another experiment. This is called the airway experiment. And um, all you do is bring in library airway, and data airway. This is a much different structure. There are eight samples, but information is recorded on all of 64,000 ensemble gene entities and some other things. Okay, and this is data that I guess came out of SRA. And the call data is as you would find in SRA. And if you run these commands, all of this gets taken care of for you. We package the data as an illustration of how to work with count data in a relatively small RNA-seq experiment. And what we illustrate here is, as you know, what is this expression doing? It's taking the airway summarized experiment and sampling down, taking only the first six genes and the first five columns, using the brackets, and generating a new summarized experiment, which has only those features and those samples, to which we can apply the assay method to get back the counts. <clears throat> now, when we look at the row ranges, the row ranges actually record more than just the gene intervals. They also tell us the um, addresses of the exons. And the counting uh, of this um, experiment is described in these notes, how to do the, the counting. We're just working on the data structure right now. The call data looks like this. There were some samples. These are actually paired samples. Some of them were uh, treated with dexamethasone. Some of them were not treated. And uh, this part of the experiment, they also did some treatments with albuterol, but 
none of the data that were reserved in this experiment uh, have albuterol treatment. So the differential expression study you might like to do would be to compare dexamethasone to control. And here we have a variation on the two-sample plot that we did previously. And, oh yes, create the visualization comparing expressions. So this is an exercise. How do you run this two-sample plot SE on this thing? Well, you would put airway as your summarized experiment. The Stratvar is dex. And the row name is this ensemble gene. Oops. Something else is on the clipboard here. OK, let's run. There. OK, so the paper was about the fact that dexamethasone seems to knock down this CRISPR CRISP LD2 gene. And we are able to see that in the raw data doing something like this. OK? It's the same sort of thing we did with the expression set. We need to pull out the assay results. We need to find the piece of the call data that corresponds to the samples that we want to stratify. And then we put some labels on. And that's that. You get a box plot. Thanks. So we'll leave that there. Yes. yes. I had a question. Yeah. I, just, I noticed that you, the IRMA set you showed us before is derived from summarized experiment. Um, and I was wondering if genomic you Genomic files, I think. Huh? Hmm? I thought it was a genomic files instance. The IRMA set? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just did is. Well, maybe you could show us how to sure, let's take explore a look. this. Yep. I was just wondering how that, how that affects the user. Good question. So um, ER set here. Oops. I have to plus this there. So ER set is an IRMA set object. And we can learn more about it by running a get class IRMA set. And get class IRMA set tells me all the different slots of the class. We're not getting into that. But I think what you're seeing here is that genomic files actually extends these uh, summarized experiments. I don't quite understand that. <laughs> yeah. But the, the class relationship is, is like this. And there must be a good reason for it. There's some sharing of code that, that is ultimately helpful for genomic files. But um, I wasn't thinking in those terms. You, you must know. You want the mic? Yeah. I, I think there will well, the, one of the major classes that um, Bioconductor uses summarize experiments, and then a lot of them just extend that. So I think genomic files makes use of summarize experiment um, yeah. okay. as an extension. Obviously, you've got the call data. Yeah, maybe to just to get the call data or something like that. Yeah, you, you wind up extending the class. All right, those are um, uh, minutiae. So um, <clears throat> we've gone through reading and counting and visualizing for these data. So let's wrap up. This was all about I ranges. I ranges represent intervals. G ranges put those intervals in a genomic context. You know lots of operations about them. The GWAS catalog can be represented as a G ranges, and find overlaps can be used to look at different things to see when they coincide. Different types of things on the same genome can be looked at together using find overlaps. <clears throat> then genomic files manages collections of bad or similar files. We went through a lot of stuff with that. In spe specifically, that you can bind a region of interest to a genomic files instance, and then your operations just pertain to that region of interest. Summarize <laughs> overlaps will be used to get uh, read counts in regions of interest. And finally, summarized experiment and ranged summarized experiment coordinates information about all these different things, samples, features, and assay results. And um, <clears throat> it works as, as we've shown a number of times. OK, questions, comments? All right. So we're going to move on now to annotation. So 
So save out your, your notebook. And let's move out to Newton period three. And remember to save a version of the notebook with your name. So we'll let everybody make their change. And then we'll go through the roadmap here. <clears throat> Well, who cares about genomic annotation? I think everybody must. And, um, you know, Bioconductor started out with three basic things. Pre-processing, because stuff was coming off microarray machines, and it needed a lot of work to make it actually interpretable. Annotation, because once you did the analysis of the properly normalized microarray, you had to figure out what was going on. In particular, you had these probes which are interrogating genes, but you needed to put the genes together, put them in context, link them to gene ontology, put them in terms of pathways, and so on. That was the second thing. Pre-processing, annotation, and analysis. So how do you actually do the analysis, fit linear models, and so on. Those were the three things going on in Bioconductor. And now annotation has become much more complicated. Um, we need to have the actual reference sequence all kinds of catalogs of regions of interest and pathways. And there's no consensus about what the right way to do this is. And there are different things for all different kinds of organisms. Well, we need to simplify the interface to all of these things. And there's a system of packages called OrgDB. There's reference sequence that we want to be able to work with. There are different builds of the human genome that we may need to have simultaneous access to. There are all these transcript and exon catalogs from different institutions for many different model organisms. And then there's finding and managing gene sets. These are topics we're going to cover here. We'll talk a little bit about ontology and round trips, getting data in and putting it out. And finally, this thing called annotation hub, which is pretty amazing, but um, is somewhat complicated as well. So our, annotation, our hierarchy, as I've said already, Genome sequence, regions of interest, and functional properties that may be cataloged in pathway catalogs or what have you. <clears throat> so we run our first chunk, which is to get all these packages in space, in, in our workspace. And then we want to do something that makes sense early on. So let's look at this. Let's think about what we will do in order to work with uh, data on humans. We're going to bring in this package called org.hs.eg.db. And there are a lot of packages like this. If you work on uh, mouse, you can put capital M, small m. On uh, rat, you can put capital R, small n. We may not have installed them all, though, so you may have to install some of them. If you work on yeast, you would put sc. But then I think you have to put sgd here, because it's not an entree gene catalog, but it's from the yeast database out in California. And if you were doing DM, I think it would also be EG. But there might be a different institution that does uh, fruit fly. So there's this pattern of package names that pertains to all the major uh, model organisms. And within each one of those, you're going to have a bunch of fields that are recorded for each one of the genes that the uh, database uh, has information on. So for example, Entree, G, entree ID is the major key for getting into this org.hs.eg. And for any given gene, there may be some RefSeq IDs. There may be ensemble gene identifiers you'd want to know about, the transcripts, the proteins that have been mapped by ensemble, gene ontology categories, and so forth. So how do we work with these? Well, we use a method called select. So given one of these packages, you can set some keys to be, in this case, symbols that you're interested in learning more about. And you can ask what types of things you want to record in columns. And in this case, we took entree ID and ensemble for the symbols BRCA2 and ORMDL3. Okay. Anybody want to give me a gene that they're interested in? Somebody. 
CFTR. Good choice. Put quotes around it. And let's hit. Yep. There we go. Now we have more information about another gene. Now, how about another thing you'd like to learn about? Gene ontology? Put that in the columns. Now, I may have done it again. Now, let's go and run it again. Now, what happened? Oh, look at that. Yes. So now, what's going on? We originally had just three lines, but these genes have been annotated to so many gene ontology categories that the table gets very long. Familiar situation? There are many different functions that seem to be annotated for BRCA2, and all of them are labeled in these gene ontology categories. Now, shall we look one of these guys up? Let's do that. We need a different data set. We need go.db. So I will just add in this new cell here, and we'll do select go.db key equals that. And if I say columns equals term, I think that'll work. Oops. Argument two, I need to say keys, I guess. There. So that's telling us that one of the things that BRCA2 was annotated to is DNA synthesis involved in DNA repair. So is that pattern clear enough? You look up some keys in one database. There may not be resolution. You need to find another database to find out what these things mean. OK? And select is the thing. You have to tell it what the keys are. Maybe sometimes you have to tell it the key type, and then what columns you want back, and you get them back. Okay. So here we go again. I think this is just pretty much the same process, but showing us that just for BRCA2, there are many different um, gene ontology category and pathway combinations. In this case, we're getting pathways from KEG, Kyoto Encyclopedia. And again, our syntax is what makes it all work in the sense that if I want to filter down to those gene ontology attributions that are traceable author statement, then I use R to go and take only the rows of this table that are traceable author statement attributions. Okay. So there. Is that because you can't use the, what is it, the path as a key? Or the evidence as a key? Um, that's a good question. Uh, can you use the evidence as a key here? If I use the evidence as a key, I'd get every gene that had a given evidence type. I'm not sure it's, in, it's among this. So that's a good question. Let's see. You can actually run key types here of uh, org.hs.eg.db. What are the legitimate things to ask for in terms of keys? And you can see here that um, evidence is one of them. So if I used evidence as a key, I would get back lots of genes that have been annotated in a certain way. How is this different from using something like Biomarkers? Which one is more up to date in terms of? It's a very good question. Uh, I don't know that Biomart has a much longer life to live, but uh, assuming that it does, the only issue with Biomart is that it's constantly changing. Whereas we've derived a lot of annotation from, from Biomart and versioned it. Okay. So you know what you get when you use a given version. But you're welcome to use Biomart. We didn't do any exercises in that. But there is a Biomart package, and it, it works fine to get those types of annotations. All right. So using go.db and then using keg through the RESTful interface. So here we are with our keg rest package. Keg REST is a package that will go out on the internet and execute commands like keg get. You give it the name of a pathway in its own terminology. It's one of the things that BRCA2 was annotated to. And it comes back with a list. We can get elements of that list. In this case, the first two elements are the entry, the given keg name, and the name, which is homologous recombination. 
and then a list of genes that are in that pathway. In this case, there are 41. So you have the entree IDs and you have the names of the genes. And finally, uh, with respect to KEG, you can also get a picture of the pathway that you're thinking of here. So this is a simple uh, raster image that um, describes this pathways in cancer pathway. Uh, and there's a bunch of genes connected to one another and different um, modules that uh, you can drill down on uh, if you learn a lot about keg. <clears throat> All right. So this is very straightforward stuff. I, I wanted to put it in as sort of the, 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 the taster. So if you're interested in, in thinking about genes in the human or any other organism, these are the patterns you're going to use. The org package will tell you about the basic gene to function annotations. And then things like keg or GoDB can be used in the way I've described. So now we will talk briefly about the ensemble resources for humans. It's a different package, a different set of packages. And uh, it has annotation that I think more people are more enthused about than the NCBI annotation. You have to bring the libraries into scope. And then you can run code like select with certain keys and certain column names. And you get back what Ensemble has to tell you about these things. In particular, the positions, sequence name. And then you can get the protein sequence that they've recorded when it's available. Now, what are the organisms for which we have packages that describe the full genomic sequence? There's a nice package called BS Genome. And it has a function called available.genomes. And if I go and run that function and then make a data table, we then see that there are 87 entries here. And you can search to find your organism of interest. We've already had someone ask about uh, fruit fly. So there you go. You can search and find that there are multiple builds of the uh, fruit fly genome available to you in terms of the full genomic sequence through the BS genome package. Now, I always make a big deal about the fact that the build version is very important. And it is, it is definitely possible to combine information from one build with information from another one without knowing about it. And um, you know, a lot of us are still working with Build 37 or HG19, which is now eight years old, even though Build 38 is uh, five years old. I don't know when the next one is scheduled. Um, what I really think is important are two things. First, when you have some data, mark it, stamp it with information about the build that it came from. Okay, we try to do that when we deliver data, but you may create data and you have to do it yourself. The other thing to know is that you can use liftover within R if you need to translate regions from one reference to another. So there are these things called chain files. And we have a, a, a workflow on Bioconductor to show you how to use it. But in essence, you take a G ranges, you run a, a liftover on it, and you get the G ranges that map to the new build um, or map from a new build to an old build using that utility. <coughs> So just to give you a, a taste for the actual genomic sequence for HG19, we have this code here. This package is 800 megabytes if you bring it in. So it is a bit of a wait to install. But once you get it, you can get, for example, the entire sequence of chromosome 17 very conveniently. And really, 81 million bases are there for you in a very compact representation. And then you can take G ranges to go and pull out the sequences for the different genes if you're interested in doing that. 
But usually people do not need the sequence for what they want to do with RNA-seq. The aligners take care of that, and they really just want to work with the addresses of known genomic elements, and that's where these TXDB packages come in. I would like to know all the exons and all the transcripts and so on that are available in a given build. And the metadata about these TXDB objects is pretty extensive. We're getting them from UCSC, the genome is HG19, and the date and time in which it was done is all recorded for you. And then, as we've done before, you can run a genes method on this and get back a G ranges that has the intervals for each one of the genes. And these are the entree gene IDs. <clears throat> you can use filters on these operations like exons and genes and so forth. In this case, what I've done is I've simply said I want to know the exon ID, of course the ranges, the transcript name and the gene ID for two genes which have these entree IDs. And the data come back. As I noted to you before, we really work with G ranges lists mostly when we are working with genes and their exons. And so you can split, you can use a split operator, which is familiar from base R, to split a G ranges into <coughs> multiple components. In this case, all the exons from each gene are segregated into different list elements. Okay, so that's all about genomic sequence. Now we can get into gene sets. Any questions? I think we're getting near break time. Um, let's go and talk about gene sets, and then we'll take a break. So the first thing we looked at was this keg called to keg rest. We looked for a certain pathway which is about homologous recombination and there's a great deal of information that comes back when we make that keg rest call telling us all about the modules from which that diagram is composed. So homologous recombination has modules like RPA complex and MRN complex and so on and you can learn more about those by interrogating keg with other tokens. Then diseases to which this gene has been, or diseases in which this pathway is implicated include these here. So this is just a big list that you have to figure out how to work with if you're interested in, in diving into there. Uh, I don't think we have many high-level functions that operate on these uh, return objects yet. There's also a bunch of literature references that come back. So that's one form of gene set that you may be interested in. Uh, the genes that come back are in the component gene. So here there were 82, um, it's, a, it's a vector of length 82, and it's a vector of uh, really 41 pairs, gene and then some character annotation about each gene. This is the entree gene ID and then some verbal annotation. So you would take your look one that comes back from KGREST, get the gene element of the list, and that would give you information about the entree IDs. We want to talk about something that I hope is familiar to some of you, which is this MSIGDB, Molecular Signatures Database, which is managed at the Broad Institute. And they have a special format for representing gene sets uh, with a GMT suffix. And uh, we'll run this code here. There's a package called GSEA base, and we have created a GMT extract, which is a set of pathways, or gene sets, really, uh, annotated to gli glioblastoma. So we'll run this little chunk here, and we get back this gene set collection. So the Broad hasn't just given you a gene set related to glioblastoma. It's given you a bunch of gene sets which are published in different papers. 
and the author of the paper and some characteristics of these gene sets uh, is given in the names. And here's a little table of the names. And so here again, we have a high-level object, GLEO-G, which is a, a, a gene set collection. We have a names operator on it, and we have the ability to take the length of the gene IDs in each one of these sets. So there are <clears throat> 47 sets, and the name of each one of these sets is given here, and the size of the set is given here. So we'll make it a little smaller so we can see both at once. Well, that's not so good. But you get the idea. And now we want to understand how redundant are these gene sets? Well, we can use the intersect function to take two of these sets, any two of them, and ask whether there are genes that recur in these two sets. And in this case, there were four. So here's a question, an exercise to work with this if you've gotten to this point. How many genes are shared between the TCGA copy number up and classical gene set identified by Verhaak? How would you do that? Well, you come back to this list of names of gene sets and see if you can find what I'm talking about here. What we see here is there's a G TCGA glioblastoma copy number up. That's what I was asking about, right? Copy number up. So that's the 40th gene set. And then there's another one by Verhaak that is called classical. Let's go to the next one here. For Hawk Classical is the 42nd one. So I think we're looking at the 40th and the 42nd. We take the intersection and we find how many genes are shared between these two gene sets. Is that clear? You have an object which is a gene set collection. You can use double bracket to get elements of gene set collection, which are gene sets themselves. There's a gene IDs operation on a gene set, and you take an intersection of two vectors of gene IDs, and you get the common genes. The full structure of the GSEA-based gene set class lets us have lots of metadata. And that comes out of a details function. So the 44th gene set is the neural type glioblastoma gene set due to Verhoek, 129 genes. And um, we can add the PubMed ID for this paper to the data set, to the gene set. <clears throat> and then it's a little richer. We can also use our PubMed, to I, PubMed ID to Miami with that PubMed ID and get the abstract for that paper. So, very nice techniques to go and query PubMed to learn about papers related to gene sets in this case. Now I want to wrap up with um, the translation between identifier types. So here we go. <clears throat> the gene ID type of this gene set can be set to be symbol identifier and that enables us to say that these are of gene ID type symbol. If I then change the gene ID type to be an annotation identifier I will instead use the entree IDs. And what you'll find is that when we do this translation, the 129 genes that were given as symbols reduce to 122 genes that have entree identifiers. And the exercise was to try to understand why that was. And I don't give the answer there. Notice that this change in annotation type leads to a different number of genes in the gene set. 
And the reason is very simple. It's just because some of the symbols that they use don't have entry IDs. And so we just lose them. All right, that's somewhat technical, but um, if you're interested in gene set enrichment analysis and so on, having this technology under your belt, uh, is, there's not a lot of commands that you have to know. It's just more knowing the potential of it, I think, that is really relevant here. And I'm sure that when Levi does the statistical analysis next time, there will be some, some examples of gene set enrichment analysis that may make use of this infrastructure. Now, what about ontologies? <clears throat> I just want to quickly take us through this idea of the various ontologies that are available for use in Bioconductor. There's a package called Ontoproc. Uh, it gives us access to, for example, the cell ontology or the cell line ontology. And there are visualization tools in a package called Ontology Plot that enable you to think about relationships between cell types. For example, uh, if we look up uh, GABAergic neuron and glutamatergic neurons in this ontology, we may want to know what are the higher level categories within which these cell types uh, are found. And this package helps us to produce uh, displays of this type. Now, there, this is coming back to, um, sorry about that, it's undoubtedly one of those credit card. Um, so we had the question, how do you get data out of Bioconductor into some other form? And this is a quick example of doing that. So let's say we bring in some, uh, we have some data out there uh, in a bed file. It looks like this. In this case, a narrow peak file. It's tab delimited. You read it into R. You have this as a bunch of strings. And then you use R track layer to make something that makes sense out of it. So if I import that file with R track layer, I get all this wonderful structure now. It's a G ranges, and there are different fields, and that's great. You have to know about the bed graph format in order to deal with that and that you, we can look up easily. I think I have the link in there. But what's important is, well, what if I want to go back out? What if I want to produce this data in another format or just make a new bed file after I filtered it somehow? Then this code will take care of that for you. Um, I set up a temporary directory uh, and then I make a file name for that demo extract demo export, and then I run the export command from this G ranges out to my temporary file, and then I read it back in. And so you can see that the export import can be used together to get data. After you've done some processing in R, you can throw it back out to disk very easily. Okay? And then we will wrap this up with a mention of Annotation Hub, a very cool package that um, includes uh, tens of thousands of files, GFF, FASTA files for different genomes and so on, uh, that are sitting out on a server that Bioconductor takes care of. And if you're interested in getting some of them, you can simply use the double bracket notation. So we get an annotation hub instance by calling annotation hub here. We get metadata about it by mentioning that object, and then we can extract information. Let's take uh, AH, AH2. What do I mean by that? So we'll just do it here. AH, AH2. With that, I have requested that Bioconductor go and download from the annotation hub the information in AH2, which is some kind of DNA information uh, about this organism. And uh, I hope it doesn't have such a big genome, but um, we're going to be pulling down the FASTA uh, files for its, its genome. Maybe I should do interrupt here. 
Well, I don't know. <laughs> Am I running the background? No. Should I interrupt? Uh, we'll just interrupt. Download failed. No problem. Um, and then, yes, this is a, actually a slow running um, command. To get the metadata about all 47,000, uh, 43,000 entities there uh, is very substantial. And we can go and query that in terms of the data classes that are available in Annotation Hub. And here's what it turns out they are. There are 10,000 bigwig files that are information about the ENCODE projects, uh, epigenomic studies. There are RLEs, which um, I suppose have to do with uh, sequence annotation, two-bit files, and VCF files. And I thought we would spend our, we would finish up with um, uh, one query to a VCF file. How many people work on human genetics? work on human variants, so you know about VCF files, right? Um, we will go and um, find out about these VCF files by running this data table command here. Um, these uh, eight VCF files are from ClinVar. And there are different subtypes. There's VCF, PAPU, and so forth. And um, you can learn about the variations here in the metadata. What I wanted to do was extract one of these guys from Annotation Hub. And in my case, it runs very quickly because I already did it before. And we can look at the header. So each VCF file has a header. And this is telling me that there are no samples recorded in this VCF file. But there's a lot of information. And that's because ClinVar isn't recording information about individuals. It's just recording information about variants. And the meta component tells me all the different things about this particular instance of the ClinVar data. Uh, and there. That's easier to read. So it tells me it's a VCF version 4, what date it was made, what's the reference genome, and something about the variation property documentation for this particular ClinVar. And then we can use G ranges to go and take a piece out of that file. So here we are, another G ranges. I want to look on chromosome 1 between bases 949,000 and 996,000. I'm running VCF, read VCF on this downloaded entity. And what I get back is information that tells me that there are 42 SNPs in this interval that have information on many different features. All of the things that ClinVar has reported on, including things about the disease database, the disease name, and so on, that ClinVar knows about these SNPs. So, if you know a region of interest, you bind it in to your query through the parameter, read the VCF. You're only going to get that small piece of the VCF and analyze it using variant annotation in order to get information about those variants. <clears throat> so I want to wrap up and then take a break. Levels of annotation, the reference sequence, annotation databases, available genomes, getting genomic sequence, and using the catalogs like Ensemble or UCSC known gene, getting gene sets, pathways, and finally doing some imports of BED and exporting, and finally working with Annotation Hub to get all kinds of data. Could be reference genomic sequence, could be ClinVar, and we've shown how to do each one of those things. So that's the scope of annotation. It's very broad. Hardly anybody uses all of it, but you're going to use some of it. And um, I hope that you find this a useful introduction to that. Uh, I think we should take 15 minutes and uh, maybe meet at uh, 2.25. Unless, is there a coffee break formally made?
Well, we just kind of played by ear. There's coffee out There's here. There's still so coffee there? Yeah, yeah. okay. So let's take minutes. a break until 2.25 um, or so. One quick question, though. So just to follow up on this, usually I know that this is something that everybody will use at the end of the experiments to, um, you know, kind of look at the data and kind of can make some sense out of the data. That's how it works out. So in your experience, like, in a general usage, what sort of, you know, can people do it on their laptops or how much resources does it take or is it going to be like, you know, just can you give us? Oh, well, everything I've used is on this laptop. Okay. So, yeah, the, the, the general annotation requirements for things like the human genome, the genome sequence itself is a gigabyte, right, mm -hmm. uh, when it's been properly compressed. Uh, maybe less. I mean, we send it out in 800 megabytes. So you have to prepare for that if you're going to go to the base level. Um, uh, and then, yeah, so here's a question. Suppose you want to work with 1,000 genomes data at the variant level, so you get these VCFs. They're multiple gigabytes. Um, we didn't deal with that. It's sitting, of course, in S3. Amazon S3 has all this VCF that has been Tabix indexed. So we can actually query that directly using R. And um, I would just do it that way. I would never have all these resources here. Region, yes, that is correct. You use the G ranges, and you get back that. Yes, that's right. So that's a, a strategy for dealing with large numbers of VCF files. You Tabix index them. You put them in some place. Nobody has to copy them anymore. But all the queries can be resolved. Yes? Just a more about Pixels software. That thousand genomes thing is amazing because there's a huge amount of data there on the internet. You can have this local object with the G ranges, you find overlaps just like you learned, and you these exact same things to fetch just the slices of the data that you need to use it like find overlaps. It's super it's, it's amazing. There's a lot of people who contribute to the ability to have that infrastructure that resolve uh, at that level. But uh, yeah, it's definitely worth uh, trying out and recognizing the scale of work you can do um, just using the tools that are sitting on our laptops, yeah. So, any other questions? Yes? Um, is there a rule of thumb for, I guess, when we're writing some of the code, there are some error messages or warning messages? I guess, what are your recommendations if we see any? Thank you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's a great question, and um, it brings me to a topic that's dear to my heart, which is debugging, right? So, in some cases, you're going to hit an error because something is really wrong, and you didn't put the right argument in that's needed, and eventually the code trips at some place, and it's not really clear what's going on. At that point, you can run the debugger on the function that failed, and it will step through and help you to find what part of the function through the error. Okay, so that's an important thing to know about. Have you I can demonstrate that if, if you really want to see that. Have you tried it in Jupyter? I, no, Jupyter, I don't no. think you can run the debugger in. You'd have to do it in, in the command line interpreter. Or RStudio, I guess you could do it. Um, with respect to warnings, warnings are always important. You always need to understand why they are happening. Oftentimes in what we're doing here, it's because we're being very conservative. We're saying there's something going on while I'm loading a package. That package might conflict with some other package, so I'll warn you. I'll let you know that it's happening. Those sorts of things you, you dismiss. You don't worry about it. You can suppress them if you want. Um, so I would say always be alert to warnings. Sometimes they're a real nuisance and you know they're not a problem. You can suppress them or you can set options warn equals zero, which will just say ignore them all. Okay? So you have ways of dealing with it, but it's a really important technique to have in working with R, understanding exceptions, understanding errors, and so on. If there's really something going on with these codes, please let me know the details and we'll come and, and work that out. These codes have been tested, so it's just because I'm skipping through things that there may be some computation that isn't found when we, we try it prematurely. But for the most part, these, these exercises do not have any meaningful errors. Okay? All right, so you've won another few minutes. Uh, we can meet at 2.30. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for coming back again. 2.34. I think we're going to wind up a little early today, and I, I hope you don't mind. Um, first, a quick question. Because of the way I've developed this material, Ashok was clear that he wanted to spend some time on visualization. 
And I think visualization is a wonderful topic to deal with uh, in working with R and working with bioconductor. Um, <clears throat> for some reason, I felt that I should introduce this um, in terms of the concept of what you're really trying to do with visualization, which is to show something about the structure of variation. And thinking systematically about variation is uh, fundamentally involved with statistics and probability, thinking systematically about variation. And so I want to know, how many of you have had a course in statistics? Just about everybody. That's great. How about probability? Quite a few. OK, that's good. So you'll, you'll recognize some of the things that I thought should be dwelt on a little bit uh, in thinking about visualization. Um, we'll start with this little package uh, set up here. Um, and then uh, I felt that we should do a little bit of formalism about what we're going to do to interpret our graphs uh, of different kinds. And so the concept of a density function seemed really important to get clear on and just to introduce the Gaussian density function. So the idea is we can really make sense of things straightforwardly when we have n data points that will denote x sub i and they are statistically independent. If they are not independent, we're going to have to do more intricate things with respect to the structure of variation, and it is not always straightforward to uh, do visualization. But I'm going to assume that they're statistically independent in what we're doing here. And their relative frequencies are given by functions of this type. This is the Gaussian density, and this is a Gaussian cumulative distribution function. I didn't want to get into definitions of random variables and, and such things. But if you've had courses in, in um, probability and statistics, then it should be fine. So this is a view of this probability distribution function. So for a standard Gaussian variate, the probability that the value is less than 0 turns out to be 0.5, and so on. Okay, That is a familiar formalism to all of you. And the density function can also be looked at here. So that is the Gaussian density. We got dead kernels over here. Dead kernels. Is Ashok still here? Yes. All right. Sorry about your kernels. Well, why don't we just not worry about the kernels right now and look at this code? Because some of you may be um, interested in, in understanding this code uh, a little bit better. Remember, I wrote a little formula there, the Gaussian density. And it's somewhat forbidding, uh, even, even now, after studying it for years, to think about pi and e and so on. And I thought it was kind of nice that you can just write that function in R, square root of 2 pi, take the reciprocal, and multiply by the exponential of minus t squared over 2. And then we want to plot this function, which is an integral, at a bunch of values of x. And so the way we do that is by running, we, we write this function which actually integrates that function from minus infinity to x. Just what we said here. It's kind of remarkable that you can do that in R. You have a function, which is this density function, and we're going to integrate it up to the different values well, what is x going to be? Well, I'm going to pick the interval minus 3 to 3 and take the uh, steps of point 1. And then what I do is I plot this interval as the x-axis, and I apply over this x-axis the function my f, which is to integrate. And that function can be integrated for all those points very rapidly. It gets done interactively right here. So. This is just a way of being very concrete about the things that are quite abstract here. right? And it seems to me very nice from a learning point of view to say, well, I can program this in R, and I can create these values of the cumulative distribution function with this small amount of code, which is doing these integrals uh, over and over again for different limits. It's not the most efficient thing in the world, but it works, and it's very elementary. Now, the density function is just plotting over the domain that I wrote there, 
the function my f. Right? This is a vector. This is a function that can be evaluated under the vector to give the values of the density function over this domain. So those are just ways of getting a handle on aspects of variation that are extremely elementary. You know, there are no data that follow this distribution, but this distribution can be used to describe the distributions of statistics uh, when we do certain sampling or aggregation activities with them. Okay? And this just shows that the built-in function in R called dnorm has exactly the same values as my handwritten version of it over this domain. So that was nice to see. I'll run that there and you see that the range is 0 to 0. Okay? Now what about QQ plots? Everybody familiar with that? It's a way of assessing whether a distributional model is appropriate for a given set of data. So the idea is the theoretical quantiles, values um, uh, of the variable that I'm thinking about can be compared to the sample quantiles and if, they, if the plot of these sampled points uh, is close to the straight line, then this sample can be thought of as being approximately normal zero, one. That's the interpretation of this QQ plot for the data that have been sampled. We didn't talk much about simulation. We didn't talk about it at all. But you can simulate data in R using the R functions, R norm, R chi square, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, are there to help you simulate data. And then we can check whether the data that have been simulated uh, are approximately normal using a QQ plot. All right, these are things that should be familiar enough to people who are doing bioinformatics and have had some statistics. How are our kernels doing? One is running. Anybody got a working kernel yet? Yes? Okay, we have it over there. All right, let's just keep rolling a little bit um, to uh, talk about some more concepts and then we'll go back to some computations. So uh, the iris data of Fisher is often used to illustrate uh, aspects of multivariate statistics. Uh, it's a data set uh, that you have in R, and it's um, a collection of measurements of different features of the flowers of the iris, and there are different species that have been measured. I think there's 50 observations on each one of three species. And the visualization we're going to start out with here is called a histogram. And I'm just looking at one of these features, the petal width, and we see with the histogram that it is uh, at least a bimodal distribution. There's lots of values near zero, lots of values in the vicinity of 1.2, and maybe there's another mode out here. The histogram can be tuned. You can have wider or narrower intervals. And how do we find out about that? <clears throat> How can we tune our histogram? Oops. Just say question mark hist, and you start to get information about histograms. And here the breaks argument can tell us how many cells we want to use. So let's make this a more fine-grained histogram. Looks like we've got about... Uh, 12 cells there. Let's do 20. It's 
And now you can see that this histogram has much less smoothness to it. We're seeing more bumps in this interval. It's not so clear. So what we've done here is we've gotten a higher level of resolution, but we've lost the aggregation that we got with the default histogram bin width. Okay? So that's a tunable histogram. And I've superimposed on this a default density estimate that uh, is another way of thinking about the variation in the data. Okay? Now I want to skip this uh, optional information, uh, but um, we will come back to the, to, the, to the iris data in terms of a multivariate data set where we start looking at variation between these uh, features in a little while. Okay? This is a classical way of looking at univariate variation in a continuous valued variable. And it's useful, for example, for gene expression measured with microarrays because we are getting real valued measurements on expression in a microarray. In uh, an experiment like the airway data, uh, one could say that it's discrete data and that you would not necessarily use this type of visualization because it is um, discrete counted data. It may still be useful. Let's give it a shot. So you're bioconductor experts now. You can say library airway, data airway. And we can do a hist of um, assay airway 1. So we're going to look at the first gene in airway. And I'll get rid of the rest of this stuff for now. Oh, yeah. Forgot about that. <clears throat> so here is a histogram uh, of the first gene. And there are only eight observations in the airway data set. <clears throat> and you can see that it's not all that informative. What if we look at the distribution of counts over samples, uh, over, over genes in one sample? How would we do that? Just put that over there. No good, right? Because the range is too large. So take a log. And there may be zeros, so add one. This is just seat of the pants computation to visualize the data in a given sample. Uh, as a unexpected, yeah. So there we are. <clears throat> Now we are visualizing all the genes for a given sample and seeing that the log distribution is such that there must be a great many genes that have value zero and a relatively modest number of genes that have positive counts going up to e to the 10. <clears throat> OK, so R will help you get at your genomics data as long as you know the syntax and know how to dig the data out. Okay, any questions about using histograms to visualize continuous data? Very straightforward, right? Okay. The optional stuff here is to look at more intricate forms of density estimation. I will get rid of that other stuff. And I'll just show you one problem with the density estimate that we got out of the iris data, which is that you see this density estimate here uh, remains positive as we go towards zero. And it's not possible to have a negative uh, width. So you want to have a density estimator that knows that there are constraints on the data. And the stuff that I've commented out there shows how to use a special type of density estimator that takes care of that. Now I want to turn to a completely different problem, which is visualization of discrete data. And um, this is a nice little data set about um, the correlation between hair color and eye color stratified by gender. <clears throat> and the source of the data is given in the um, man page for this data set. <clears throat> and uh, what I wanted to do was collapse over the genders to begin with <clears throat> and ask, what, what can we do to visualize this? What can we learn about um, variation 
in these categorical measurements. And there is a discipline in statistics called categorical data analysis or log linear modeling. And there's a technique for doing this. Uh, the goodness of fit of an independence model, which asserts that high eye color is uninformative about hair color, uh, can be assessed using Pearson's chi-squared statistic. And we have a way of visualizing whether that is a good model or not. And this is the method of visualizing it. It's called uh, a mosaic plot or a mosaic plot with um, residuals only. <clears throat> and the idea here is that there are some categories, let's say, where the model seems to fit well. The probabilities of the events that we see, brown hair and brown eye, seems to be consistent with the product of the marginal probabilities. But there are other events, like black and brown, together occur much more frequently than you would expect if the two traits were independent. That is also the case for blonde hair and blue eyes, much more frequently occurring than if these two traits were independent. So this is a way of visualizing information related to the hypothesis, and in fact contrary to the hypothesis, that hot eye color and hair color are genetically independent. If you only saw gray boxes that weren't too big, then you would be more comfortable with the independence hypothesis. Since you see these large boxes, we would think that this is not uh, the right hypothesis. We would say there's evidence against it. That's a two-dimensional problem. It's just eye versus hair. We can also look at the three-dimensional pro problem, which takes into account the gender of individuals. And this is called a mosaic plot, because it really does uh, break the data up and allow you to see the relative frequencies of the different combinations. And again, because there are exceptions to the um, small residual from the independence model, uh, specifically, let's say, uh, here, this would be blonde with brown hair, blonde with brown eyes, uh, very rare for both males and females. That's an exception to the independence hypothesis. <clears throat> so I, I thought it would be very useful uh, especially for people who are doing genetics of, of discrete traits, to have some visualizations for uh, discrete data as well. <clears throat> Any questions or comments about that? The man page on these things uh, is very good, so you can learn more about it there. I've also given some links to the Wikipedia pages on categorical data analysis. I think it is very much worth doing. Now, Go back to the iris data and think about how we would do distribution modeling for these continuous traits that may vary between species. So here's sepal length. These box plots show us the medians and the ranges of the data and the first and third quartiles, approximately, for the different species. So you can see here a clear relationship between species and sepal length. And uh, perhaps, if there's some genetic relationship uh, that you could find varying between these, uh, an additive model might work. <clears throat> um, sepal width doesn't quite have the same uh, ordering, so maybe it's a, a trait that works in, in a different manner. Oh, thank you. Am I failing again? Uh -huh. We can plug it in here. Uh, or, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. So these are called marginal, um, marginal distribution vision visualizations, uh, marginal by species and also marginal by um, feature that I'm looking at. And we'd like to look at this in terms of joint distributions. How do these uh, features co-vary? And um, before I get into that, what's being lost here? The information is being summarized into about five different points for each one of these samples. And if you want to look at it at a higher level of resolution, you can use a plotting algorithm called B-Swarm. So now you can actually see the actual observations here. And um, what you also see here is that there's a bit of a problem with the uh, species labels. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but I did have the solution here to tilt the labels. 
And so um, you can run this thing one more time here, uh, B swarm with axis equals false. And then we're going to embellish it. Let's run this one more time here. Oops. What did we do here? Oh, that's the wrong symbol. Oops. Axis is not a, not a symbol that you can use there. So some, some other, I think it's axes that you have to put there. So. Okay. There we go. Axes are equal to false. And now I'm going to put something in to take care of the labels and put them at an angle. I think that should work. There we go. Now I'm not going to expect you to copy this. I just want to give you some sense of uh, how, that, how, how this works. You turn off the axes when you do the original plot. You then put one of the axes on that you know is going to be OK. In this case, it's axis 2. And then you must do something to the text and specify that it's going on the bottom axis and you are rotating these labels by 45 degrees. And that's what enables them to, to, to all be plotted here. So there's some very technical stuff that can be done uh, when you have a problem with default plotting and it's in the code for the box plots. Let's go back to the plain old scatter plot here. So this is marginalizing over all the species plotting sepal length against sepal width. But I've introduced this thing called jittering because there are so many ties in the data that there's actually a lot of overplotting if you don't jitter one of the variables. So now you can see when these variables are close to one another, it's just a little random perturbation to each one of the x points, x values for these points. And now we are going to put some more embellishments on this plot. So now I can distinguish the different species by colors. I've used jittering so that there isn't severe overplotting. And I can see now that there's some structure in the variation. When I plot sepal length against sepal width, one of these species seems to be quite well separated from the other two. And that's the kind of thing we're trying to expose in our visualizations. So let's look at the code for that one more time. You can ignore this. This just has to do with um, Jupiter. I'm using plotting. I'm using a formula here where I take a variable, sepal.length, jitter sepal.width, and use the iris data as the source of these variables. I use PCH equals 19 to give myself a solid dot. And the color is just the species which is also coming out of data iris. All right, that gives me the points and the axes. And then I'm going to put a legend on it. I have to figure out where the x and y coordinates of the legend should be. The colors are 1 to 3. And the legend is going to be the levels of the species factor. And I will not put a box around it. So this is telling me that these are setosa and so on. <clears throat> Is that plot clear? Now, here's a nice way of looking at all the features together. It's called a pairs plot. Okay? And you now see that when I plot petal length against any of the other features, the setosa uh, tend to uh, be very well separated. The only problem here is it's kind of hard to put a legend in one of these plots. These pairs plots, I'm sure Marcel has a good way of doing it, but uh, you could figure out where this is, for example, and then you could put those, that legend there, but uh, I'm not going to get into that right now. We'll show some other ways of using ggplot to make nice visualizations of this type that I think may be more effective. Now, another nice way of looking at multivariate data is with the cluster package. And uh, I'm not going to go into any of the details here, but I just wanted people to have this uh, potential in mind. 
um, a default method of doing cluster analysis will take a representation of the data, define the centroids of different clusters that are defined only by the features in the data, and allow you to visualize them in this way. These turn out to be the first two principal components in the default plot. And I've set some, some options so that you can see the actual species uh, using the color of the visualization. And one of the strange things here is this uh, member of the green species that is um, <coughs> right in the middle of uh, a different cluster. And you wonder then whether there may have been a mislabeling of one of these flowers. That's something one can spend some, some time on in another context. This call is really very simple. You have the iris data. You're using the cluster package. You use something called partitioning around metoids with the three clusters. You have to tell it the number of clusters. And then you just use a plot. So this is the kind of thing that is used all the time with dimension reduction for genomics data. And I'm sure we'll have examples uh, when the next course comes around. <clears throat> OK. So those are just a couple of ways of using what's really base graphics in R with different sets of options and so forth to do scatter plots and so forth. The grammar of graphics, ggplot2, is a, a much more sophisticated uh, software tool that produces correspondingly more sophisticated visualizations. And um, to get going to justify this, let's go ahead and just try it out. We will use a ggplot here to develop a view of the histograms by species. OK? So here we are. We run a ggplot command. We'll start with the iris data set. And we'll tell it through this thing called the aesthetics binding that we'll use sepal.length as the x variable. And we will build histograms as the geometric representation of variation in sepal length. And we'll facet this visualization by species. So these are the different facets. And the histograms just count up numbers of observations in different bins. Very nice single call that uh, builds up this way of representing variation. <clears throat> And it takes care of many things for you. For example, the x-axis will be common across all the facets. The y-axis will be common across the facets. You can free them up if you want. You add additional options to the faceting. Now here's another very nice display to look at what you might call two-dimensional histograms. So now. Uh, we are looking at petal length versus sepal length, again stratifying by species, and counting up and showing uh, with the color how many uh, observations fall in each one of these bins. So you can say that for setosa, for this bivariate distribution, it's much more concentrated in a small region of this plane than for the other two species. Okay, so you're visualizing variation Again, very conveniently, just setting up the x and the y bindings through the ggplot command, and then saying, I want to do this two-dimensional binning of the data with a facet on species. OK. So there's an exercise here. Let's see what this display looks like. This is very nice. So instead of using two-dimensional binning and counting, we're going to compute density estimates, bivariate density estimates. And these are contour plots, like topographic maps, that show that the concentration uh, of the sepal length, petal length, bivariate distribution is uh, in a certain region there. Slightly different for virginica and very different for setosa. <clears throat> and I'm sure you can imagine many places where you'd like to have this type of visualization for bivariate distributions. The data for setosa plants 
seem peculiar. Now, what's going on there? We have to turn this into markdown. There are at least five data points outside the extreme data contours. So I thought that was interesting. When you look at this, you see that the same density algorithm is being used for each one of these. There's one point here that's completely out, but for this one, there are five. And the question is, do you, can you write the code that will zoom in to see what's going on with these data? So we modify this code to zoom in. So let's try it. What's the first thing we can do here to zoom in? What should I put here? Don't all shout out at once. <laughs> OK, so we've done that. What did that do? That's a new piece of R called subset. And what are the dimensions of IR2 now? Oops, sorry about that. What are the dimensions here? It's a 50 by 5. OK, great. So now we're going to keep going. We're going to try and embellish our plot so that we are working with IR2. And we're going to do a geom density 2D. So let's see if that works. Well, it seems to have succeeded. And now I need to mention this to the interpreter. This is G1. And it will plot it out. There. So something is missing. What do I need to do here to see those points that are outliers? OK. We haven't lectured about this. But if you've seen GG plot, you will know that you can just take a plot and add some additional parameters to it to embellish it. And now we can see that there are uh, quite a few points that don't lie within these standard density contours. And it would be interesting to know uh, what's going on with them. And how to locate them and so on is a matter of inter interactive graphics that uh, I'm not going to get into right now, but it can be done. <clears throat> Yes? I'm not modifying the original data. I mean, the data are coming in, and I'm applying a function to them to uh, alter their uh, positions. So let's just do it like this. Nothing's happening to the data, right? But you don't see anymore all the overplotting that's going on. The overplotting, the, the jittering is just sort of a, uh, an inline perturbation of the data so that this visualization doesn't have the overplotting. But the data are just, they're immutable, unless you actually do something to the IR2 in this case. Any other questions, comments? All right. Now I want to take us to a, a, an extension of the GG, the grammar of graphics, for bioinformatics. It's called GGBio, and it works uh, somewhat like GGplot, but actually many things have been wrapped up for you so that you can do uh, wonderful things like this. Okay, So these are all the chromosomes, all the standard chromosomes. And we have a G ranges called HEPG2 which is showing where a certain transcription factor binds to the genome. And what you have here is a little line drawn wherever a binding site was recorded for HEPG2. Now we have another data set called GM12878. HEPG2 is a liver cell. Uh, GM12878 is a, an immortalized B cell. And if you do the same plot for 1, 2, 8, 7, 8, you see that there's quite a bit more, larger number of binding sites. So this is just exploratory data. You get a G ranges. You want to see what's going on on the genome. You just use GGBio. 
you use auto plot with the G ranges, you can have different types of layouts, and uh, that's the karyogram layout. The GGBio documentation needs some work, and uh, there will be GGBio 2, and I don't really want to go into that too much more. Gene models we talked about a little bit. If you start out with the gene symbol data, which is coming out of a package called BioVisBase, this is a mapping <coughs> that's familiar to us. It's only 29,000 genes, and its origins can be found in the BioVisBase package. But here we are. We're going to take a small number of genes, in this case just two genes, and um, subset our G ranges down, call it OO, and then we'll use this autoplot function on the homo.sapiens object with a which parameter, which limits us to the genes that have been listed here, and then we set the gap.geome to be chevron. <laughs> That's just another special parameter, and what that means is we get a picture now of the gene models that is a little more uh, refined than we have seen before. So what's going on here, there are isoforms of GSDMB that have skipped exons in different places. <clears throat> and some have left off, some exons can be left off completely, and we still see isoforms. So this autoplot can give you a quick view of the complexity of, of a gene model uh, once you've got a G ranges. Okay. Now I want to talk about another package called GVIS. Now GVIS, uh, I'll just, sh you know, again, the, the aesthetics of the um, display is uh, really what's distinctive about this. Uh, there's a very rich infrastructure. We'll go through the code in a minute. What we're going to do here is just show how you can visualize data on um, transcription factor affinities uh, in the vicinity of uh, some gene models and show the models themselves. And it takes a while to produce the display because of a lot of formatting that is going on. But there it is. Now this is a pretty nice display. Uh, we start out with what's called a genome axis track which shows us where on the chromosome we have zoomed in. So this is on chromosome 11. And we have a data track where the binding scores for this ESRA binding factor are shown. And then we have the genes in a fairly crude form uh, for the major isoforms <coughs> in this panel. Okay, So you can start to get a sense for uh, genes that may have, let's say, promoter regions that uh, may be occupied by this ESRRA. It's not particularly easy. It's something you can also do, perhaps, with the genome browser, but this allows you to do it programmatically and uh, to have a sense of quantities in ways that it would be a bit challenging to do with the genome browser. <clears throat> and I wanted to uh, conclude with uh, what's called a sashimi plot. The sashimi plot is uh, created by the um, MISO project. And um, I don't know how familiar this is to you, but it's basically a way of showing uh, what's going on with uh, RNA-seq data when you may have alternative splicing going on. And so we'll go through the code here. And here's the idea that you're seeing how it reads can be found in different parts of the experiment that may skip exons. Uh, in this case, this is the wild type. In the knock, knockout line, there is much less data. How do we do this? Well, remember, the RNA-seq data is coming to us in BAM files. And in GVIS, there's a nice function called alignments track that will work on these BAM files and use specific um, parameters to control the display of those alignments. These are paired-end alignments. 
and we're telling you which chromosome and what genome we're working with. And then we use our gene symbol data to define a G ranges. <coughs> That's the interval that we want to work with. And then we use something called plot tracks to plot the various tracks here, which include the knockout track. And this is showing us that uh, the coverage here is extremely low uh, for these exons that we can see here, extremely low, much less than 100. Whereas when you look in the wild type data, uh, the exons can have coverage exceeding 300. And the um, isoform distribution can be sketched, let's say, which uh, isoforms are actually observed in the data, which exons are left out in the data that we observe in this particular sample. That's the purpose of the Shishimi plot. And we found that the, um, your, your computer may succeed in, in running this, but if you only had four gigabytes on your computer, this could uh, crash the system. So this is a fairly uh, involved uh, visualization, but it's the kind of thing that RNA-seq users uh, are often very interested in doing. So uh, we will wrap up just to review. Um, the structure of variation is the purpose of our visualization. We showed how to deal with certain univariate visualization concepts, QQ plots for checking adequacy of a distribution or model, histograms, densities, categorical data visualization with mosaics, and then box plots, scatter plots, dimension reduction, and the grammar of graphics. So um, it's a lot of material. Uh, and uh, I thank you for hanging in there. And I'll take any questions, but I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, a few things. First, again, thank you, Vince, for uh, taking the time and effort for putting together this wonderful workshop. Um, thanks to everybody for being patient with some of the technical glitches we had here. You uh, the early part of the day. And thanks to Levi and Marcel for being for being here to help us. Um, so first thing is, you know, please if you do want to save your notebooks, you know, you can do a file download as easiest thing is to save it as HTML so that you have all the code and all the output as you have generated as is on your local machine. Second, we will make these materials available. Uh, you know, to you in, uh, in a few days on, on our website so that you can you know, download the same material. We also have you know, um, a Docker container and we have instructions on how to install things and so on and so forth so that you know, this kind of becomes a self contained thing that we can go back to as well. We'll eventually have the video up there um, as well. Um, and then, oh, and then the second Registration just opened up for um, the next workshop, which is on the 19th, which um, I believe I will be um, presenting there. And uh, please sign up because we're already up to like 50% as of 2 p.m., so um, no guarantees. <laughs> um, and um, and finally, you know, I think we can, I think we can, it's only 320, so so that you can wait around for 20 minutes or so, so that if anybody has any additional questions, um, you know, questions about the next workshop, um, you know, this workshop, please, um, you know, and then um, please feel free to email me, or cbc health at brown.edu if you have any further questions. Um, again, thanks everyone, and thanks. Yeah, I also want to put in a plug for Andrew Leith, who did a great job setting these up. Of course, there were some glitches. I don't think they're his fault. Uh, we're yeah. working with Amazon, we're working with very complex technology, so I really want to thank you, Andrew, for the effort you put in. We've been working on this for a while. Uh, you've taken a lot, um, and I'm sure it was very painful at times, but uh, if you give it some time, I think it will work into your work and it will be productive for you. Um, these uh, notebooks are also in my GitHub repo, and so if you want to raise issues or improve them in any way, you can always file an issue on those, and we should coordinate. If yeah. you put them in yours, then let's make sure we are well, in I mean, sync. Or, or link to mine, whatever you want.